you to um, say some more words. I actually think that there's some real uh, magic in what he just said. I spend a lot of time these days um, talking to my voice recorder, transcribing that into text, and then using that text inside GPT to do a whole bunch of different things. And I found it's one of the most effective ways for me to interact with it. And maybe some of you also have heard this before, but I also have written a um, like personal coaching and mental health bot. And so what I do is I uh, record in the mornings my journaling, essentially. I, I just wake up and start talking to my phone about whatever's on my mind. And then I, feed, I transcribe it and feed that text through my personal coach bot, which analyzes my thoughts and writings from like 10 different perspectives, including a um, psychologist, a nutritionist, a brand strategist, a harsh critic, a creative, a, a supportive girlfriend, a whole bunch of different personas that I've developed. And then it kind of reviews my work and I have not make me to do lists and stuff like that. So um, one of the tools I'll be mentioning and suggesting you add to the toolkit later is something like Otter AI. I'm using Fathom here in this meeting to record everything and it makes notes and summarizes to do's and gives action items. And it's a real game changer when it comes to um, just my, my internal business processes. Maddie, uh, Maddie, I'll skip you for now since you got sandwich mouth, Kevin. I'm okay, but all right, go for it. <clears throat> so this is, so I am coming up with some really impressive people <clears throat> with some really exciting and impressive histories. Um, one's a bit more modest. Um, the head of production at Carvana, which is an online auto retailer, um, we make their I make their commercials, and I would say that I wouldn't say I've been in denial, but um, I would say that uh, I've been just, I, I'm I'm aware this tidal wave is coming, and I don't want to be the person on the beach looking saying, "Wow, isn't the tide low uh, today?" Um, and I'm really, I was in my aha moment. I mean, when uh, Sora came out, or is coming out, I'm like, wow, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm a, if I'm managing PLs for an agency or what have you, I'm really paying attention to this. And um, in terms of, in terms of where we are now with uh, testing and data-driven marketing, um, and I, the, the amount of testing we do on with the paid social, I can just see the benefit of learnings rather than just producing a really like fun bit of brand marketing, uh, I'm like, wow, you know, um, brands are as interested in capturing data as they are in, in, uh, changing minds or, or brand strategy and what have you. So, um, I, I would say that this, the Sora, <laughs> the Sora moment this week, uh, is like the big kind of pushing me over the edge to spend uh, a couple hundred bucks to listen to your good self talk. Um, but, um, uh, I think there's also like a, a little sort of kid inside of me of where, you know, I'm, I make films and make documentaries on my off time outside of um, running production here. And uh, the big barrier to me is like, shoot, like, where am I going to go and make, how am I going to go and make this film? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love a way just to satisfy my personal creative ambitions um, and find a really fun and, and sort of keep my love alive for making things. And sometimes you can lose that in the humdrum of, you know, uh, you know, managing other people's careers. So there's like a little boy inside me as well, um, which is pushing me to do this too. I think that speaks to what I was saying when I when I said at the beginning, I feel as creative as I've been in my whole life. You know, I really, uh, I, there's, a, there's a playful artistic creative side that's been really emerging with some of this kind of stuff. And um, so I, I know what you mean. I'm excited to introduce you guys to Kevin. I came across Kevin's work about nine months ago, and he I've asked him to join us today to present some of that work. And so I'll let him just give an intro, and then we'll have him come back later. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Broom. I'm, uh, I run a graphic design and branding uh, agency on um, the Sunshine Coast. I live in Roberts Creek. Um, and I'm also the one of the founding directors of the Living Forest Institute, which is a nonprofit here on the coast that uh, whose goal is to connect communities with their local forests, um, and which is also relevant to um, what I'm going to be presenting later today. So, um, yeah, the the aha moments for me with AI, um, first of all, was just that kind of those side of the desk projects, realizing that I could put as little energy as I was already putting into some of my side projects 
by kind of, but throwing, you know, just spending five minutes and saying, hey, come up with an outline for X and knowing that that's kind of at least the first draft of that is kind of ready to be reviewed and and jumped on when I have time to to look at it. Um, so just kind of getting getting ideas fired up. Mm -hmm. um, Zero to one, as Robert would say. Yeah. When it came to uh, when it came to Mid Journey, and this this is kind of part of the presentation today, but I, I originally um, I actually had um, it was about a year ago exactly to the day. And um, I actually had just done an ayahuasca ceremony for three days and discovered Mid Journey, I think the first week back from that. <laughs> and so there's this strange connection between Mid Journey and ayahuasca for me, where I'm not actually sure where one begins and the other ends. Um, and I find and I find Mid Journey super psychedelic in terms of the way you think about things and the way that you can um, juxtapose and mash together um different ideas that other like that just could not actually be mashed together in any other venue um and so i find it a really um it's never been for me like how do i make this picture look exactly like this model of car it's more like just what can this do and and how can we how can i explore it so it's always i've always come at it with uh, i used it as a visual for my ayahuasca journey afterwards as part of the re-entry was just kind of to I tried to create, recreate some of the things I'd seen, some of the ideas that had come up in there. And so um, for me, it's always been kind of this, like an exploration and a curiosity um, that I've approached the, the platform with. I find that really fascinating. You're only the second person I've ever heard say that. There's a woman who I know um, pretty well called Cole Hansen in Brooklyn. And she literally, her business right now is using... AI, GPT, and MidJourney to do post psychedelic integrations with people. So she literally, <laughs> like, after you do your trips, you sit down with her, and she's got a process around AI where she helps you do some integration on your on your journey. And uh, and I haven't looked into it too much, but it's, that's interesting. You guys are sounds like you're both barking up the same tree. <laughs> Kristen, I'm so happy I'm being after the ayahuasca connection <laughs> i'm a composer and musician performing artist that's what i'm most known for um but i'm also a trained writer director a lot of people don't realize that and um currently writing my first book and i make a lot of interactive experiential um, content and experiences and uh really excited to be here my first ai experience um Exper experiment was actually back in 2017, 2018 with uh, MIT, where we did some experiments with my music and um, AI, and it was like a different era of AI. So we're in a different world now. Mm -hmm. And I've been tracking a lot and um, paying attention a lot with the AI community. Like the, I get brought into a lot of high tech um, conversations as an artist I mean a good example is on Necker Island which are Branson's Island they had a gathering of AI experts and they had me come and bring the heart to the to these tech conversations because I could hang in that scene and so I'm tracking really closely but it's but it but as an artist I'm like watching tracking but I haven't really executed my own uh, relationship uh, with content making with AI so it's time to do that. Um, it was kind of on my mind with my current projects and then universe provides and KK emails me right when I'm like, I need to start getting my hands dirty in AI a little deeper than I am and not just uh, tracking and observing. So here we are, perfect timing. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been thinking that like, you know, acting like AI is gonna save the world is not the answer and burying our heads in the sand and pretending it's gonna go away isn't exactly the answer either. And so all you guys represent what I think is the answer, which is like figuring this out, running alongside it, asking some questions and figuring out what kind of stuff we can make work inside our studios. I wanted to drop two more little tidbits about Kristen. Um, she has moonlighted as the speaker coach for Ted. So a lot of Ted talks you've probably seen along the way have had some sort of Kristen sprinkled on top of them. And um, yeah, I have a whole public speaking behind the scenes world, which I apply, but I don't, I don't, it's all like NDA land usually. So I brag for you. they does public, but you know, but yeah, I, I can help people communicate a little better too. It's, it's part of my secret sauce, Very good. but I present, but I present as 
the artist. Oh, and I wanted you to just tell one more quick story too. Uh, uh, this is just adjacent to AI. It's about threads and social media, but just, just give us a 15 or 20 second. You've had a threads explosion and I've been watching you kind of nurture that a little bit. Would you meant talk about that? Yeah, I love that. Pl- it's funny because Twitter, I never really vibed with. Um, threads, I gained like 3000 followers in the last six weeks. It's really interesting. Um, I just find that place has a little more heart. It's just a, there's a lot of creatives there of who creatives, I think they yeah. feel like a lot of creative people. I think that platform is seen a lot of AI talk too, um, yeah. as like a safer place for, for creativity and the more kind of spiritual and people commiserating on the, the experience of being whatever your vertical is. Yeah. Um, I bring it up only to say that, like, I hope that we're all able to interconnect with each other after this. So follow Kristen on threads and let's find each other, track each other down and, you know, continue on this conversation and journey together. Michelle, would you please go next? Yes, I knew it. (laughs) I knew I was going to go after Kristen. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm a creative freelancer, uh, filmmaking background, and I mostly work on really large scale art installations these days, kind of cinematic art stuff. Uh, I worked on the the giant sphere project in Las Vegas for a few years, actually. And we, um, yeah. yeah. Um, you know what? I was just thinking about the dome project that we were working on back in the day. And that's so interesting that you did spheres too, because I can see a direct connection. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, def- definitely. And actually one of my, um, to presence another hollyhock homie, um, my main motivation for being here today is I'm working on a really sweet project with David McConville. And um, I've been a bit resistant to the whole world of AI and tools and whatnot. Um, But that project is motivating me to, to kind of dig in because it'll be so useful for what we're doing. We're dealing with a lot of historic kind of imagery and and bringing it to life and animating it and um, just looking for, you know, some great sort of video tools to speed all of that along and and add a lot of sort of creative juice so when i knew um, david he was leading the um, buckminster fuller design science studio and buckminster yeah. fuller institute he's a world leading uh systems thinker and uh buckminster fuller uh historian i would say and stuff so he's a he's a badass too <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And he also he he did a, you know, 750 page PhD dissertation on domes and spheres and the history of planetariums. And so the project we're working on is is kind of a bit more in that realm. Um, it, so, Neil, yeah, Neil, yeah, fun stuff. Up there because you can probably tell Neil lives in a dome. Um, one of the coolest oh. domes I've ever seen there. He's on the second floor of it, but you can kind of gather through that triangular window there. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, um, love it. I don't want to be surprising here. I just thought I was going in order, but just so you guys know, it's going to go Jody, Peter, Bella, Gabby, Gina, Sarah, Sam, Miriam, Daniela. Jody. Hey, folks. My name is Jody Tanita, and I am originally from British Columbia, but I live on the Waianae coast of Oahu in Hawaii. Um, I am a surfer, so that's what brings me, uh, to, to Hawaii. And, um, my background is as a social movement strategist and really a steward of that ecosystem and helping people understand how to build power, think long-term, um, and collaborate. Um, and I am now really playing the role of a, leader, a strategist, and a coach, more broadly speaking. Um, And there's sort of two realms that I am working in. So right now, I am playing the role of business manager for an artist, Adrienne Marie Brown, and really bringing all of her garden and of ideas um, under one roof and really thinking about... um, She's very prolific, a writer, um, singer, uh, thought leader, and just really thinking about 
AI and its support of um, moving ideas out into the world and um, through that lens. And then I also have a really deep interest right now in women's sports and the billions of dollars that are going to start moving into and around that and how we do that differently than what has happened as a leak capture of that capital in um in men's sports mm -hmm. and how much dignity there is in that realm and how we can use dignity as a tool for um, social transformation. So um, my aha you moment, got me. You got me. I, so... I came here, Chris, no pressure for my AI aha moment. Okay. Right. I like you and I have been like, in each other's orbits for a couple of decades now, I really um, trust what you're doing and um, appreciate the ways in which you often synthesize and um, an offer and have been kind of waiting for the opportunity to absorb that and to weave myself into this ecosystem in some organic way. So that's really what I am here to do. I'm a collaborative thinker. And so the idea that I'm like constant, that I'm like can generate something and the zero to one is really appealing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, it's interesting writers and, and, and artists like the person you're working with, it's like on one hand, it's gotta be super scary because AI can write really, really well. On another hand, somebody who's been writing their whole life and has access to a lifetime of writing to bring into AI and work with and transform and make sense out of, that person's got a huge leg up over somebody who doesn't have that stuff outside of them already. And so, you know, that's the type of perspective that I would try to, you know, cultivate with people like that is like, yeah, it's really good at writing and it can do some magical stuff, but also like, let's, let's look at it slightly different. Let's, let's use it to work on this stuff that we already have in the world. And, you know, to that point, um, the more that I think that we can get out of us and into the world to be, to work with AI. And that's why I do the kind of journaling in the mornings and the talking into my voice recorder as often as I can. I've had it look at transcripts of my YouTube videos, transcripts of podcasts, all of that data, when people are like, you know, data is the new, you know, gold standard or the new currency, that's the type of stuff they're talking about. Every word they've ever written, every image they've ever made, those, we can apply AI to those things and then start to make some sense of that kind of stuff. So um, I'm stoked you're here. Peter? Hey, nice to meet you all. I have known Chris, I don't even know, not that long, but we have really jived. It's been a fantastic learning adventure alongside him. So my background is in multimedia journalism and film originally. I'm an alum and have been a lecturer at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism in the new media program there for the last eight years. And my background really spans across a variety of different types of technologies for storytelling. Originally, I was really into hardware, right, and things like drones and AR and VR and sort of immersive forms of storytelling were my jam. And uh, I was a correspondent for several years and, you know, based in Mongolia overseas, where I freelanced for the New York Times and CNN and, you know, all those fake news uh, outlets that I could really land any type of visual story with and really enjoyed that. I uh, began really sort of a startup journey working with a news tech company during the pandemic, had to switch to remote work, couldn't really do as much travel or live production, obviously. Uh, and I've bounced around quite a bit, eventually launching my own company that's really focused on bridging the digital skills gap when it comes to AI. I first started teaching AI in my courses at Berkeley about four years ago, when it was really tough to find something to even play around with that was, you know, compelling. Uh, or even promising, right, for students, but we kept saying, you know, things are moving pretty fast here, keep an eye on it, and then suddenly last year hit, and bam, you know, half my syllabus suddenly, or more is AI, right, and so um, because of all of the interest, and my background also before journalism even was in public relations, and storytelling, you know, for kind of commercial, yeah, clients, and uh, I've straddled, you know, kind of both nonfiction storytelling and commercial work quite a bit in the last 
year or so and have been doing a mixture of consulting as well as my own online training courses. So Chris has helped me as a guest and he's really done some incredible work with Midjourney uh, and, you know, HeyGen and some of these other cool image and video generation tools that I've been inspired by and, and have learned from him. And uh, I think we continue to learn from one another and help each other out. We're actually launching a course together yeah that starts next month at six sessions it'll be a lot of immersive yeah really visual creative oriented content um, to have more time to digest and apply and practice and um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about general frameworks and concepts today shortly but such a pleasure to be here I'm such a huge fan of you know your work Chris and it's yeah really an honor to meet you all here. What a fun group. This is Peter, amazing. Peter's awesome. We've been a really great one-two punch. He's really organized and curriculum-based and has been able to guide me through and allow me to come sprinkle my magic in his classes and stuff like that. So we're wrapping up a six-part work uh, series today, right after this. I have to leave five minutes after this is over and hop on Peter's class um, where we're, we're, we're having class six of six. And it's been great. And you guys will benefit from some of the stuff we've learned along the way. Bella? Hello. Well, lovely to meet all of you guys. Um, I'm Bella Moa. I'm a design director at an agency in Los Angeles called Clever Creative. We're a small agency. We do a lot of branding, um, anything from startups to, to well-known brands out there. We're working with them. Um, and yeah, so I do a lot of like logo design, packaging design, web, uh, touch upon a lot of different things. And it's been, I do a lot of freelance work as well. And I'm an artist. And so I have other interests in terms of where AI can take us, but I'm definitely noticing um, there's a lot of fear in the world of design and branding with what AI is capable of and what, you know, what that means for us with this idea that everything we do should be so custom and so unique and come out of our own brains. And so what does that mean when we have this tool? And and it's interesting, um, you know, I keep thinking of when designers didn't have internet and then suddenly there was internet and that fear of what does that mean? It feels like another wave of that. Um, and But it's very exciting. Um, so I'm definitely, I feel resistant. I, I think a few people mentioned resistance. I definitely feel the resistance a little bit, but I'm more excited than anything else. And um, yeah, and I think my my sort of fun experiments have been actually, even though I'm a, a visual creative, um, chat GPT has been the most exciting thing on my end. I love what you're sharing about the what you built, Chris, because that like I've been using it a little bit with like life problems, real life stuff and see what it comes up with, not just creative. And then when it comes to creative, to see how the more this is a weird example. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Akashic Records. It's like a whole technique for you to tap into your intuition, right? And the whole idea is like, the more you talk about it, the more cool stuff you're going to get from it. And ChatGPT is the same thing. And exactly so the same, yeah. yeah, yeah. We joke that it's like, is it aliens that are like learning and giving us ideas? Or like, is it just your intuition? And you're like, not right but it's a similar system that like the more custom information you give it the more it feeds you back and then that collaborative um back and forth i think so far is what I, i've been digging quite a lot it's so interesting and it leads me to, to this other thought i've been having lately which is you know a lot of people especially like in peter's and i's professional communicators class there's often, you know, that resistance that, uh, oh, well, what if it hallucinates? AI is hallucinating. It's making up results. It's making up citations. And then I think about it more for like the visual communicator crowd. And for us, a lot of times those hallucinations are like what I'm after. I'm trying to, I'm not trying to deliver finished art to a client that I'm developing in mid journey. I'm trying to explore an idea and be expansive and brainstorm and to really come up with things I haven't thought of yet. And so that's how I'm using it. And I welcome its hallucinations. And I find that those are the things that I uh, often find the most valuable. Chris, can I say something? Of course. So a lot of this is kind of thinking forward. And so one thing that I want to put out there, Bella, because I've been working with some agencies on this, you and everyone else on here that does creative knows that you've gone to a client and you'll take four ideas and they pick one and they move forward with one of them. 
And then that those three ideas that you've come up with just kind of sit there and they, you know, you may try and re you know, use them for another person uh, purpose. But one of the things that we're exploring is using AI to go back in and try and resurface ideas and see how they may be applicable for something new. And I think what you're going to see, especially over the next probably 18 months, is people go back to technology startups and sit there and say, hey, yeah, this crashed and burned three years ago, but what if it was reimagined and they're going to use AI to help kind of reimagine that and say, how could that be applied now? And so when everyone talks about how AI is kind of forward thinking, I'm also looking at how it can uncover some of the thinking of the past and resurface it and maybe find new ways to use it. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. Gina, you're up next. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Gina Donlin, and I actually work for Amazon. I'm a user experience researcher on a team that works to make the day-to-day -day experiences just a little bit better for the associates in the fulfillment centers. Um, my biggest AI light bulb moment this past year, um, I'm really interested in like human computer interaction literature and going to talks and things about that. I found myself playing a game that was sort of an AI Turing test um, called human or bot, where you played, you chatted with something for two minutes and then you had to guess whether it was a person or not. And that was, I found myself playing that for hours and hours and just like analyzing the strategies that I would use and what I thought another person would use to figure out if I was talking to a computer or not. And that was just mind blowing. <laughs> and so I'm not like directly a, you know, visual creative, but I support a lot of creative people and want to, you know, get my feet a little more wet and in interacting with this stuff directly. Cause I think it's super cool. Awesome. Thank you, Gina. Um, okay. Our next intro is going to be a little bit of a hybrid one, and this has to do with timing here. And so I'm going to have Jeremy um, Toman introduce himself next, but he's also going to be our first presentation at the same time. So I just want to let you know what's going on here, guys. Jeremy is the CEO of AugX Labs out of New York. He has a tool called Augie. We've been using the tool pretty extensively at Future Proof Creatives to experiment and to make voiceover animated videos and animations um, on the fly. And so, and I want to also say that Jeremy's a longtime friend of mine. We also know each uh, Jody, I know Jeremy through Sarah Pullman, which is pretty interesting. Um, uh, Anyway, Jeremy, you take it from here. I just, you know, I just I guess wanted to say, um, Jeremy also supports us financially, this organization. He helps me um, train other people, share information about his tools, experiment and give him feedback. And so he was like one of the first people before the, I even started this company to um, say, I support you guys. And so thanks, Jeremy, and um, whatever we can do to support you as well. Thanks, bud. I think, I think it's what, like year 18 or something like that? Let, let's put it this way. I, I had almost as much hair as Chris did back then, and none of it was gray. So it's uh it's 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 been a bit. Um, uh, in the portrait photography industry, we call it silver for the record, not gray. Uh-huh. So um I'm gonna call it gray. Uh no, I'm just messing. Um uh so yeah, I've been basically in the field of, of the convergence of media and technology basically my entire career. Uh, I was at companies like Sling Media, if anyone remembers the Slingbox from a ways back. Uh, I was um, I helped launch a few startups like Sonos and Voodoo and Waze. Uh, I had a few more startups since then, and then I had kids, so I did some big company time at uh, companies like CBS and Warner Media. And a couple of years ago. Um, you know, during the pandemic, a very good friend of mine and I started a podcast together and, you know, pandemic, you either had to break, make bread or, or start a podcast. Like there was the law, remember? And, uh, and so we did this podcast. It was just for fun. It was just talking about movies. And one of the things I'd read was this tip that was like, you know, you should make a little video trailer for your podcast. Cause the truth is everybody finds podcasts now on YouTube. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I had creative suite. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make myself a, a trailer. I swear to you, I did like 40 hours of self-paced tutorials trying to learn how to use Premiere Pro because it's a gorgeous, gorgeous tool. But as has been made clear to me, that's like me learning how to fly a helicopter to go get milk at the corner store. 
Mm -hmm. right? I, it's, it's so much more powerful than what I need. Um, and I, and my hat's off to all of you who know how to use it. Uh, but from that experience, it made me think that there's got to be something a little easier for us to all use, especially considering how much of content that we create isn't actually the essence of the audience's desire. What I mean by that is the difference between a movie trailer and a movie, right? The movie trailer, as much as they may entertain us and people like me go gobble them up, but, um, but realistically, the purpose of a trailer is to watch a movie, not to watch a trailer. Right. And we can get really basic with like the purpose of an ad is to sell a product or things like that. But it got me into thinking, like, how can we unlock people from being able to create, whether it's promotional content, storytelling content, narrative content, whatever it might be, where it doesn't have to be up here, everything. Right. Um, and along the same way, while talking to a bunch of people who were video adept, one of the things they kept saying is, you know, we spend so much of our time just getting the basics of things together, putting this clip here and that clip here and adjusting the timeline. And so we built this product called Augie and we've been saying the phrase that we turn your words into video. And what we built is, and, and the very first idea that I said to my co-founder was, I wanna just do a thing where I just talk and whatever the words I say, you just find me cool memes or stuff. Like that was literally how this all started. And uh, from there, we went on and built a partnership with Getty Images to get access to their premium catalog, but in a way that would be affordable for a lot more people. Um, all right, Chris, you want me to show, you want me to stop talking, show a little demo? No, no, no. I'm just saying you okay. control, just letting you know. All right. All right. Happy to. Um, um, so we built a partnership with Getty that lets us use Getty stock content in our product, but in an affordable price point for normal people, right? So the same clips that would cost you 150 to $800 for like 10 seconds of like man swinging tennis racket, uh, we put into our product that basically a, a $40 a month, all you can eat kind of package. It's actually and kind so, of the pro tip here is if you want access to Getty's videos and you don't want to pay for it, sign up for Augie for 40 bucks a month to get access to Getty's video library. I have no comment on that remark. Um, you're paying $40 a month for a wonderful product experience and whatever <laughs> else you might get along with it. <laughs> um, um, so what, what our vision though is, is that any kind of creator, whether that's literally an advertiser doing pure commercial stuff, all the way to someone like Chris, who's super creative and inventive. And I mean, you all get his emails and it's just like, oh my gosh, right? And we wanted that you don't have to go learn all the crazy tools just to put those kind of content together. Uh, and so uh, we started the company about two and a bit years ago before all of the LLM and generative AI stuff really hit the mainstream. Since it showed up, though, it just opened up a world of new possibilities. So we integrated 11 labs, which I'm sure many of you played with. So that's AI voices. We have a couple of hundred AI voices built into the product. Uh, we've integrated uh, chat. Yeah. Maybe not everyone has heard of 11 labs. It's a tool oh. by reading scripts into and recording your voice. You can make a voice clone. Once you have a voice clone, you can essentially generate text files in GPT and then it'll create MP3s of you speaking that in your own voice. And so we'll, we'll show some of that later, but that's what he's talking about, 11 Labs. You should all check it out. Everyone should build a voice. You know what? I'm just gonna go into a demo. Let's 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 stop talking about what we're talking. We'll have a little bit of fun. Um, and, uh, oh, there we go, cheers. Um, Robert, also maybe you would prep for us one of the Future Proof Creatives, Augie's to show in a second. Yeah, I can. So this is our dashboard. Uh, if you saw it in, uh, in, in the discord or on LinkedIn, we've recently launched a new feature we call storyteller. Storyteller is basically the fun side of Augie, whereas what we call our classic is more the business side. Um, we should call it like, it's our mullet feature work up front, party in the back. Yeah. What do you guys think about that? Um, so I'm just going to make two quick demos. So the first one, we're going to do a storyteller video. I would love for anybody, we can use a chat or whatever, or Chris, you can, you can be in charge. I'd love for, 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 uh, someone to give me a little idea of, an, of a, let's make something up right now. Um, Chris, you're creative. You want to give me something? Or uh, something pick, about, pick. um, uh, surfing, surfing in Oahu. And then Jody can take it from there. All right, Jody, we're going to go surfing, but we're going to go something, so surfing somewhere completely unused. Like, how about surfing on a lava flow in Mars, on Mars? 
Sure. And can it be geckos surfing? Geckos surfing Perfect. lava flows on Mars. By the way, I'm also going to say this is AI land. So as of the moment I start going from here, who knows what happens? <laughs> um, we do a lot of prompt work to try to get a real story out. So there's actually a lot of uh, uh, um, prompting to really try to get it to be um, to sound more natural, right? Like if you think about most ChatGPT content kind of sounds the same, right? And even we're still victim of it. You'll get a lot of inner worlds in our product. Uh, we're always working on that. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to say, I take issue every time someone says all GPT content sounds the same. The only people that say that are people that have only scratched the surface of it. They've used just the standard thing. They put in a few words and then some stuff comes out and that all sounds the same. But anytime I'm using it for writing, I, it's, it's highly customizable. Me and Robert and our friend Kayam are having an ongoing contest with who can make writing bots that sound the least like AI. And Kayam's got one that can pass. He's got it to 3% detectability. It can only detect 3% of ChatGPT's voice in Kayam's writing. So anyway, keep Amazing. going. I mean, no worries. Um, but I, I think building on your point, though, Chris, is that's what we have under the hood as well. We don't want all your stories to sound the same. We don't want we we now granted, we actually really want you to come and adjust and tweak and make your own thing. But uh, in the meantime, let's just keep moving through here. So these are voices powered by AI. Including Hi, I'm Hannah, and I'll be the voice of your Augie today. Hi, I'm Grace, and I'll be the voice of your Augie today. Cool. Hi, I'm Gerald, and I'll be the voice of your Augie today. So these are all AI voices. And to Chris's point, I'll show you how to do it in a second. You can also just clone your own. We're adding little tips as we start figuring out how to sort of help the user through picking voices better. Hi, I'm Amy, and I'll be the voice of your Augie today. So let's just go with Amy. And now the next thing we're going to do is pick a style. So we've, you know, same same argument Chris was just making. We've taken the time to predefine about 137 unique styles. And they go everything from like claymation, watercolor, uh, photographic, Pokemon, et cetera. I will also make something very clear. There's not a single prompt, our entire vernacular, that uses copyrighted prompt style. So anything that you see, including one here that says Mario World, is because specifically there has already been a release of trademark style restrictions on what can be done. We believe strongly that the burden of protecting creators is on the person who does the prompt, as yeah. well as industry stuff too. I want to not make anything clear, but um, we there's nothing that happens in here that is built on top of any of those models. So. Um, that said, I'm going to pick a style. There's um, actually, I, I got to say these uh, these these funky ones are always my favorite. So I'm going to do fairy tale, and I'm going to hit. Um, oh my god, I have to I have to give myself a credit. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, give me just two seconds here. That's all right. Um, Robert, would you run that Augie while he's doing that? Yes. Sorry. Uh, no problem. It's all here. good. I actually just so. Do you uh, have it? Yeah, it's already done. Okay. And we're going to continue where we were and let's go. Uh, it is uh, just so you also know we, uh, we <clears throat> charge for this, but we are literally charging the cost of the rendering. So um because this is a design is sort of a fun feature you know our goal as a business to make our money off large company and we're basically mid-market and enterprise and then have the product available for use for individual creators we're actually free for nonprofits and educational institutions so really trying to leverage leverage the big guys so that we can empower the small guys as we go mm -hmm. this takes a few minutes so while it goes i'm going to show you what our classic feature does and this is where um our the bulk of our use happens today if you already have content like a narration and you want to use that, you can. Again, if you already have a script, you can. But we sort of take this teach a person to fish model. And so what we've learned is, you know, if you think about it, most people don't even realize that not all videos are alike. You know, there's a big difference if I'm making an ad versus being a thought leadership versus just telling a story, right? And so again, to Chris's point on clever prompting, all of this affects under the hood how the video is generated. So today I'll just do a, we'll just do a fun educational video. Um, Chris, you, you already gave me surfing. Is there, is there another, uh, is there another thing we might want to do a video about another activity, hobby, business, something? 
You got something for me? How about photography? It was uh, exploring, exploring an art warehouse, a warehouse full of art or something like that. I don't know. Um, how about learning about appreciating art? Sure. I so can... maybe you're the MoMA and you want to make an ad on TikTok explaining to young people why they should learn how to appreciate art, right? Um, and so it's there, there you go. There's an in the world. Uh, so, so we can use this. I'm going to leave it alone. But here I'll also show you the, the voice part. So I can choose to record this myself. So I can do the in a world where colors dance on canvas, but nobody really wants to hear me do that. So instead, I'm going to go to again one of the AI voices. But for this one, I'll actually choose my cloned voice and we'll do a little preview. So I, I recorded myself earlier than this. Uh, if you saw in the interface, there's just a little checkbox you check to say, record my voice. Um, by the way, everything I'm showing you is also in our free product here. So if you want to try it and you're nervous, it's free. Please use it. We'd love your feedback. Um, in a world where colors dance on canvas and sculptures whisper untold stories, we embark on a journey to uncover the secrets of the art realm. Hmm. What, is what do you think? How, how close to me was that? I mean, close enough that if, if some, yeah, very close. All right. So let's go. And now we can decide, are we doing this example again on TikTok or is this for YouTube? You can always change this later, but it does help to orient it from the beginning. Uh, the last thing here is, as I mentioned, so our partnership with Getty includes over 60 million clips of both uh, stock uh, visuals as well as stock imagery. But if you're making like a fun video for your friends or something and you want to use memes or internet content, you can use that too. You can also decide you're only going to use your own content. Our vision of things Which is, is what most we people do. have. Yeah. yeah, most people have some content they need. Very few have all of what they need. So by having the stock in there, you know that way. If you're, you know, if Chris is going to do a video like next time I'm in New York City and he wants to have the Brooklyn Bridge go by, he doesn't have to fly to New York City to take that clip himself. He can just use one of those. Um, so here we go. I will say, if you're going to try the product, by the way, right now, and this will change in about eight weeks. Once you hit go from here, you won't be able to re-edit the audio. So you won't be able to cut a word out. You won't be able to change the script. Uh, that's coming very, very soon. But right now, as of this moment, when I hit go, it's sort of locked in digital stone per se. So we always recommend to give that a listen. So here's what our product's doing. Again, I said we turn your words into videos. So we listen to the audio. We create a transcript from that. We then actually use AI to determine the cadence of the speaker's voice, because what we want to do is do natural shot breakup. So if you've ever seen any form of timeline in any video editing tool, there's always a, a storyboard effectively. The last thing we do, and you saw it just finished, is for each slot in that storyboard, we look at the words that were being said, and we match that up to content from the Getty Stock Library. If you have your own content over the next few weeks, you'll see that it will actually, instead of pulling from Getty, will actually pull from your own library. Ooh, um, I want that. Yeah, so yeah. I'll actually show you that in advance. So um, this is oh, a clip I, I uploaded. That, that would make this it fun... so much more valuable for me. I want to load up all my assets into that. Well, so in this case, I picked, um, <laughs> this is silly, but it was really good for demo purposes. I uploaded a clip from the movie, The Fast and the Furious. Um, but like pretend you're trying to assemble from your hours and hours of content and you know you've got this one great car chase sequence somewhere in there. What we do is we use computer vision combined with natural language search so that you can uh -huh. find clips plus or minus three seconds of whatever you're looking for. If I want an explosion, I can go find an explosion. And that's and search the clip. only in the clip in your library and it's finding the timestamp? Yep. Oh, my God. oh, but you can do more than that. You can grab the clip. You can decide you want the six second version of it and hit save and it adds it into your Augie library for all the wow. rest. Wow. Does it have so eyes that's... and ears or only eyes? Pardon me? Does it have eyes and ears or only eyes? Uh, today it's eyes. Uh, about three weeks it'll have ears too. And then I'm we're going to also support. If it's searchable only based on the images or if it can also search the audio content as well. It's going to search the audio content. We're also going to allow you to search by sound effects if you want to find like a dog barking or a gunshot or something like that. Um, so moving into it, so this is what we call our rough cut report. And what we show you is A, what we made. B, if you were a novice Premiere user, how roughly long it might have taken you to do this manually based on actual user or real world data. But the last thing we do, again, for everybody who's experimented with AI and you've ever seen a couple of extra thumbs, 
we actually want to bring it to the surface. Like we don't think this is perfect. We're very transparent uh, for two reasons. One is the AI is never going to be perfect, but and I mean that. But two, we want you to have your own flair on this. So even if you're just making an ad for your business, your business and my business are different. Your video and my video shouldn't be the same. So no matter what we do, we still want to represent what the individual, whether that's a brand, a person, a company, whatever might need. So this is our rough cut. Our mileage may vary, but let's take a look at what we have. In a world where colors dance on canvas and sculptures whisper untold stories, we embark on a journey to uncover the secrets of the art realm. Brush strokes speak volumes, and every stroke tells a tale waiting to be discovered. Dive. Okay, so I'm not going to finish the whole thing, but as you can see, it definitely got the gist of it. Now, I might come along and say, well, I got the gist, but this isn't actually what I want. So I'm going to go right back to the beginning here. And I do love this canvas colors thing, but I actually wanted colors on canvas. So there's a, there's colors on canvas. I think that's a little bit more fun. Um, and what happened is it used the words to give a prompt to, to Getty to uh -huh. get clips. So if I instead want to say um, blank canvas, for example, and see what we get, uh -huh. we'll get some, right? So look at that. And you can always change this. Remember, I said before, you want memes, click on animated GIF. And let me tell you, you're going to get memes. Um, I'm using the premium catalog here. We also have a, a free stock catalog as well. Um, so there we go. We have a brushstroke. Now, in this part, as I recall, I said something about statues whispering untold stories. So I, as much as I like the, the, the trumpeter, I'm going to say statues. And sure enough, we're going to get a couple of different, you know, whatever they might have out there. But we want to be a museum. So let's, there we go. Everybody likes a good uh, good thinker. And then lastly, this embark on a journey. I don't know if the maze was I wanted. I want, um, I'm no, just going to put in the word journey. What's that? Yeah, the maze is, that one is stock, stock photography. Let's grab a different one. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and it even looks very stock. But, you yeah. know, maybe, in fact, I'm going to say museum. And go put in someone coming into a museum. Cool. Right now, I could also decide I'm going to use my own content. So you saw before, here's my explosion. Right. And I was helping my friend out who has a nonprofit law, law group. And so here's her logo. So you can put in anything of your own. You can upload from your hard drive. You can upload from Dropbox and you can even paste by URL. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really, really don't want this to be, hey, it's a lot of stock video stapled all together. It's just more you can use stock to supplement whatever you have. Awesome. Anyhow, I want to get to uh, to finish this up. So show a couple last things. You can you can add different visual effects. They probably don't do too much on the statue. Um, we have built in background music, over 6,000 clips, all again, full licensing rights. So I can preview them all, adjust the volume, all sorts of things. We have automatic closed captioning and subtitling. And we've even built, you know, as many sort of TikTok style effects uh, because, you know, that they work well with, with, with consumers. So... Here's uh here's what we call our, our keyword effect. And I'm gonna just do uh make this a little funky for us. And there we go. And so now we've spent, you know, our two minutes on it. A world where colors dance on canvas and sculptures whisper untold stories. We embark on a journey to uncover the secrets of the art realm. Brush strokes speak volumes. And you can see where we could take this and finish it all up. But that's yeah. the that's the the big core of our product. And hopefully just a few minutes, if you need to promote something yourself, your business, or again, just tell a good story, you can do it in just a few minutes. Yeah, that's awesome. I, thank you for joining us. I know you're on a bit of a, a time crunch. Kristen, I'm even thinking like, it'd be fun to make little music videos, like where you first generate a bunch of images in mid journey that are aligned with your theme. And then you bring in, you know, 15 storyboarded images with song and they'll like, kind of come bring some clips together. It kind of could be low, low budget uh, threads content or something like that, you know? Jeremy, I'm going I'm I'm to be in touch with you. I'm in Brooklyn awesome. as well. Here's our uh, here's here's our gecko surfing in lava on Mars. Let's let's cross our fingers and see what the AI did. In the fiery heart of Mars, a mesmerizing sight unfolds. Geckos, with their <laughs> tiny grips and vibrant scales, ride the molten waves with grace and daring. The red lava, a sea of raw power, becomes their playground, a dance with destiny. Their tails flick in perfect balance, a testament to agility in the face of adversity. With each crest and fall, they embody resilience and freedom a symbol of conquering the impossible. And as they surf the fiery tides of the unknown, we witness a spectacle that defies expectation and inspires wonder. 
So one thing I will say, we're still working on our prompt continuity. It is a, it is a challenge, but you can even see here, close up on the faces of young creatures, right? So now I would come back in and say, actually, it should have said geckos and hit generate. That'll take another minute or so, so I won't waste your time. Um, but- uh, A lot of ways, I'll... it's really actually useful for us to see how you would uh, change that. That was good. Thank you, even though it was a quick one there. That's awesome. too funny. With their tiny little sticky fingers and their colorful skin. I'll finish up that video, um, uh, hopefully later tonight, but probably not till uh, in a couple of days this weekend. I'll drop it in the Discord, uh, in your Discord. Cool. For and I know you've got to run, but would you text Gabby the one month free code that you offered to people so they can check things out? I'm about Gabby's to Gabby's already got it. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Jeremy, a quick question before we go. Uh, is there any restriction on time length about the content you can create? The storyteller mode, so the generative is one minute right now. Um, we're using a very primitive model from Stable Diffusion because things like Sora don't have APIs yet. Um, but as soon as Sora or Runway or Pika or any of them have public facing APIs, our intent is to integrate all of them and increase that max length. The okay. max length of a, of a standard Augie video right now is 10 minutes and eventually that'll go up to an hour plus. Yeah. Okay, great, great, thanks. That's awesome. Yeah, and um, Chris has my contact info. I'm in the Discord. We're doing a webinar next week. Happy to answer any of your questions at that time. And thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me in to, to this group. I'm like, you're the kind of people I just want to spend all the time with because I know when we give you tools like this, you do things like, I mean, like gecko surfing lava. And Please the make great. sure that I have an invite to your webinar. I'll make sure that all my peeps know about it and are there. Me awesome. too, Jeremy. Yeah. Amazing work. I've been in the beta for the last year and a half and it's just insane how fast they're moving. And yeah, Jeremy, major props. Yeah. Please pass that along to the team. Thanks Great. so much, buddy. Nice to see you. All right. Have a good one, y'all. So guys, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I know that we're in the middle of introductions and the uh, agenda that I shared earlier has a different agenda on it. We are just being a little bit flexible so that we can accommodate like CEO schedules and have Jeremy pop in. And so it's slightly out of order. Please bear with me. Um, I would hey, like hey, to reach. Out. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah. Hey, Chris, let me just kind of, you know, close that out uh, and just show a couple of clips really quickly. So, yes, please. Because um, I, I have a good example of the different ways that we've used it. Their traditional model, which I think is pretty interesting. So um, we have an AI product that will go out, read the news, and then summarize content from the latest news and generate uh, a piece. And so one of the things we were looking at was California organic wines. And so we created this piece. It's all sourced from uh, reputable uh, uh, news outlets. And then we turned it into this. Hey there, wine enthusiasts. Welcome to the world of California organic wine. We're here to take you on a journey through the vineyards, wineries, and stories behind this incredible industry. California is a land of sunshine, fertile soil, and a rich winemaking history. Did you know that California is also a leader in organic wine production? That's right, folks. California produces more organic wine than any other state in the U.S. So what's the big deal about organic wine? Well, for starters, it's so very straight-laced, very kind of news-centric. Uh, then, uh, based on the artwork that we're doing, uh, we created something that's more whimsical. In the infinite fabric of the cosmos dwelled three souls. Full screen. Uh, sorry. Aria the dream weaver wandered through worlds unseen, ah, ah. her imagination painting reality across dimensions. As she slumbered, her vibrant dreams rippled through the galaxy, seeds of possibility taking root in the farthest corners of creation. Above watched the ancient eye, a silent sentinel keeping ceaseless guard over existence. Its presence was the anchor on which the balance of the universe turned, protecting the endless stories unfolding below. And in the so imagery step, that we created in Mid Journey, and then we created used Claude to create the uh, script, and then brought that in, brought our original artwork into Augie, used their functionality to animate our static images so you saw movement within that so a little bit more creative and then we uh, subway recently launched a bunch of things and we wanted to create like kind of a little bit more of a fun thing welcome to the snack attack your quick bite to snacking with your host sammy snacks here to give you the latest buzz on subway's newest menu craze the footlong sidekicks nom 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 
That's right. Subway is kicking boring sandwiches to the curb and rolling out ginormous goodies like the foot-long cookie, foot-long churro, and foot-long pretzel. We're going full Willy Wonka with these creations. I sampled that cookie first, and let me tell you, one nibble, and I was in total cookie heaven. Chocolate chips as big as my eyeballs, oozing melty sweetness with every monster bite, had milk dripping. So just really wanted to kind of show the flexibility, more of a new straight, you know, straight kind of news piece, more of a creative piece, and then kind of fun bloggy uh, kind of piece. That's awesome, man. Thank you very much. And I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the, the takeaways there is like you can start making videos without audio, video editing skills with generated photos and generated text. It's, it's really quite amazing. Thank you, Robert. Um, so before I proceed with the intros, I just want to say to those of you who haven't popped your face or audio on, no pressure to. Uh, if for some reason you're hiding out, that's no problem. But I'm, I'm just going to continue down the road, but just opt out if you need to. So, um, Sarah, do you want to go next? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, nice to see everybody here. Um, amazing diversity of backgrounds here. Um, personally, I'm in journalism. I'm the social media manager at a news magazine based in Vancouver called The Tai. Um, and yeah, I don't know. My uh, aha moment with AI was kind of just seeing its wild rise in popularity and normalizing it as like a very everyday usable tool um, among young people, among young creatives, among people who um, kind of like somebody was saying earlier, I can't remember who, but uh, you know, we don't need these really extensive tools all the time to create cool stuff. You can just kind of get back to the basics. And as a social media manager, I extremely relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am using way too many tools that I'm not necessarily an expert in. So yeah, this is kind of my um, dive into it. And uh, uh, also, as somebody said earlier, I'm kind of trying to embrace AI as a tool for, you know, expanding my ideas and figuring out how to approach things when, you know, I have a new idea for a new project, um, instead of being so afraid of it as like somebody who's been a writer my whole life. Um, yeah, that's me. I Thanks love I love GPT for my all my social media work. It's so useful. I have it build me out calendars all the time. Like, here's the three topics I want to be talking about this month. Make me a social media calendar. And then I just go through and revise it in the spirit of like Robert's, you know, zero to one concept. And then like, I'm always uh, dictating my phone and then having that turn it into written stuff. But then I take the written stuff and I'm like, in accordance with the social media calendar you just made me take this long form blog post and create Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn content. And, and, and so yeah, it's just really giving me a huge leg up in that regard. And cool. You can do that with that GPC. Yeah. So like it will give you like a, but it won't give you a graphic calendar. It will give you a, if you like want a script. graphic calendar, it will give you that. But I was actually referring to a text-based calendar, like just to say week one, Mondays, you post on LinkedIn about, you know, the menu. Right. Wednesdays, you post on Facebook about it. But that being said, if you're like, now represent that as a diagram, it can do that as well. Goodness me. Yeah. Um, Sam. Hey, guys. Um, sorry, as Chris says, I'm hiding out today. I'm actually really under the weather, so. No problem. Um, my picture is probably better than <laughs> how I feel. <laughs> I am a designer and construction home builder in Nashville, Tennessee. So I kind of had a, well, first of all, also, I just want to tell all of you how humbled and grateful I am to be in this group. Um, I just had to say that like capital letters. Um, I had a couple of AI aha moments. I go to Fast Company Innovation Festival in New York every year, and they have amazing classes and people from all over the world. And every year, every session is so different. But this last year, every single session was AI. They literally had nothing but AI and how it applies to every single kind of field that you can imagine. And I started working with a client and came across a picture on IG that was an inspiration that we were trying to figure out. And when I look at the accreditation for the, the 
what I thought was photography it was actually AI generated wow. um, interior design for this house that was being built. And it was, it's so crazy. I feel like my field is so behind on that technical aspect of allowing people to literally walk through their homes before they're even built yeah. and have it look like so realistic. Mm -hmm. So I am, I have a learning curve. I hope y'all can be a little patient with me, but mm -hmm. I, I love collaborating. I love to learn um, all the things. I don't have a tech background. I come from fashion and architecture. So I, I just, I'm super excited to be able to apply all of these wonderful things from amazing talented people to my construction world. Yeah. Hey, Sam, uh, people have been asking me like, um, hey, Chris, how fast do you see this change in the creative industries or whatever? And I have an anecdote that's like sort of related to your space. There's this company in Vancouver here called Article and they're an online furniture retailer. I think they did like a billion dollars. They're big. And um, they have a 12 person uh, creative studio that does all their product photography um, for all their websites and all that kind of stuff. They recently, December, um, closed their studio. They uh, okay. replaced their photographers, set designers, and stylists with CGI animators and AI experts. They're building a full production studio, virtual production studio inside, you know, AI and VR essentially. And they're doing all their photo shoots from now on virtually okay. fake via AI. And they look like real, they, they're like real settings and real products, but synthetic photos. So can I chime in on that too? Yeah. There's a company, I think that's out of Australia that virtually, like you have a warehouse and you virtually um, almost like screen the entire warehouse where you can physically walk through your entire mm -hmm. home and change the rooms as you go through the thing. So I'm super interested in bringing that to our neck of the woods. Uh, you know, the South is also a little slower on the uptake on some of these um, IT generated things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just want to get ahead as, as much as I can, because I feel like we're really behind. Well, only an hour and 15 minutes in you guys, and we're almost done with introductions. Um, Mary, <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself? Otherwise, I'm going to. Uh, sorry, you said Miriam, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll unmute myself. That would help. Um, Chris, nice to see you again. We'll tell a story um, offline about, you're not going to remember, but we met about 12 years ago and had a very funny conversation about iPhones. <laughs> I'm the director of the Vancouver Biennale. Uh, and if you're not familiar, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that brings public art uh, to Metro Vancouver. Uh, I think we're one of the biggest, if not the biggest, Biennale in North America. We work with everyone from, you know, Ai Weiwei, Andy Goldsworthy, the biggest names in the art world, through to some of the most exciting, emerging, young, talented artists uh, internationally that you've never heard of and we want to give them a, a, a global stage. Uh, so it's a fantastic, fantastic job. Never a dull moment. Um, but nobody I think would ever realize that we're like at best we're three and a half people doing upwards of, I think we've done 250 public art exhibitions in the last 20 years a huge educational program, huge artist residency program. So we look bigger than we are. Yes. So my curiosity with technology in general, and this in particular, is sort of threefold. One is just from a very practical business operations perspective. Uh, we never have enough capacity. So how do we become way more efficient? How do we ensure quality output? How do we improve on costs? Um, I think your, your original question was, you know, when, when was your last light bulb moment? Mine was 15 minutes ago looking at Augie. 
Uh -huh. Because as the person responsible for the marketing and audience engagement of the Biennale, of course, I have paid external or companies to do sort of brand narrative videos for us, but they're 10, 15, $20,000. They take three months to create and I can do one every six years. Yeah. And so, the back and forth is excruciating. Oh, it's excruciating. Exactly. So I look at something like this as a, I'm the complete neophyte in this crowd. But I look at something like this and my brain just explodes with ideas. That's the light bulb moment that I'm talking about. Yes, Mary. Right. Thank you, you so just, much. <laughs> you just explode with, oh my God, I can do this. I know what to do. I can ramp up quickly. I can push this out to our audience. How freaking exciting is that? And I know that's just you know, one, a half a percent of what I could learn and embrace. So there's the business side, there's the marketing side, you know, how do we engage our audience and not just push things out, but how does it become engaging? Um, and how do we, how do we share that narrative in a way that people really it, you know, was thought provoking and people really embraced and people truly come back to you with what's next, you know, in exciting ways. And then the third thing is, you know, how does art intersect with technology? So we deal in public art and even in the last few years, the whole definition of what's public has changed because of technology. Hmm. Public isn't necessarily site specific anymore. It's not at all. Public is global. Mm. So we try to find this magic blend of being a traditional Biennale with all of those curatorial standards and the baggage that that brings mm -hmm. with also embracing what is emerging and how do we become a leader embracing technology and art mm -hmm. so yeah. for example and when we dive in we try and do a deep dive so we did the first and i think largest at the time this was two years ago um installation based on live blockchain and that was a huge thing for us and a huge learning and took us down nfts and that whole world um but we you know our litmus test is always accessibility so we always want to be accessible we always want to be relevant and technology is just so relevant right now we have to be in that space um you know interactive experiential uh and just even from a curatorial perspective how does technology change you know we talk about democratization but how does technology really impact the foundation of what we do which starts with a curatorial process so for me it's this big octopus it impacts our entire business yeah from the artists that we bring in the audience that we're trying to speak to and engage with right through to our operations and how do we actually fulfill on this by not expanding necessarily our headcount, but being much smarter by embracing technology. So super, super exciting. What a great intro, Miriam. Thank you so much. And I swear to God, guys, I didn't, she wasn't a plant with that whole uh, first part of her intro, but I'm really glad that you're, you're getting something out of this already, Miriam. I wanted Thank to rip on something that you said um, about uh, the kind of curatorial perspective and as it relates to generative AI and art and, and um, editing and a critical eye and all, all this, you know, I think a lot about like, okay, so these tools allow us to do things at a very high, it's like almost anything you can conceive of can be done at an almost perfection level of quality, um, whether it's, you know, image making or writing or whatever. And so it's like, in a world where you can do anything at a super high level of proficiency, all of a sudden it's like what you choose to do with your limited amount of time becomes like the most important thing. Or to say it another way, it's like uh, like in the art world, like tech technique 
is now maxed out at, 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 at the level of AI. AI can do everything perfect. So all of a sudden it's a lot more about the concept. It's really, you better have a good fucking idea. And by the way, I want to hear about the 9,000 ideas you didn't choose when you arrived at sharing this. Like why, are, why are you showing me what you're showing me? It seems to be um, as relevant as ever, really. Oh, absolutely. And it gets more and more difficult because there's more and more output. So I guess I would use the analogy. It's also, it's sort of like, how does a professor get tenured? It's not enough to know your um, field inside out and backwards. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to be like technically brilliant. You actually have to take your field one step further you have to add to your field yes so that's sort of how i see all of this digital techno art mm -hmm. it's not enough to be able to use the tool that's a lot <laughs> but using the tool doesn't make you an artist what makes you an artist to me remains the same are you taking the artwork somewhere new and fresh Yes, And I would say that to a sculptor, like a real hand and tool sculptor, to anybody working, you know, in the digital realm. I think it's the same litmus test. I'm cheering you on over here, Miriam, because what you just described is the reasons why I invited Kevin Broom to talk here today. So I just need to do a little read here with Peter. Peter, I'd like to jump right into Kevin's stuff. And I know that that ices you out of what you were planning to give um all oh, good man i'm excited i'm really enjoying okay i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna here. go on the fly then. so the one of the reasons i asked kevin to talk is a lot of uh pardon my french people's generative ai stuff is just a jerk off they're just out there doing whatever they can do oh look this looks cool uh check this thing out oh by the way michelle i wanted to invite your friend on camera if they want i know yeah, i'm not gonna like charge you a double or something and if they got other people who are listening and they want to hang out they're welcome to, to join us so Thank you. He's just shy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's cool. He's also welcome to to um, to stay off the camera over there as well. <laughs> yeah, Peter. I was just waving. Oh, I see. Um, so the reason I asked Kevin to speak today is because he's doing really cool stuff that's beautiful and pushing the envelope, but he's doing it not for its own sake, but with a mission and a purpose behind it. And he's advancing his values and objectives in the world is using these tools. And so Kevin, I'm gonna let you take it from there. I'm gonna just step away for a quick second, go to the washroom and I'll be right back. But you're up, Kevin. I think you're muted. Are you able to share your screen, Kevin? Oh, hello? Now we yep. can mute. Okay, that's good. Always best to do start your presentation without mute on. Um, Hang on one second. Chris kind of caught me off guard. I thought I was, I had a little bit of time here, but uh, I'm ready to go. Um, okay. Um, so, I have, a, I have a little presentation that I, I came up with. I wasn't totally sure who was on this call and what this call was completely about today. <laughs> so um, I've made a presentation at the beginning that kind of just talks about some of the process that I've experienced um, playing with Midjourney. Um, and then uh, from there, it kind of leads naturally into um, the project that uh, Chris was alluding to. Um, so like I said, I, like I said in, in my intro, um, I had this ayahuasca, I came across mid-journey at the same time as I had done an ayahuasca journey and I uh, used mid-journey as part of my integration and reintegration back into my life to kind of answer questions I had. And, and like I said, it really, I, I really loved the way that it allowed me to mash ideas together um, that otherwise would never find each other. Um, and so, a typical progress for me, a, a typical, I, I see mid journey as a journey and I tend to kind of talk about a night on, if I, if I spend the night playing with mid journey, I, I look at back and it's kind of, that is the journey I went on and it, and I look at, see how the images evolved as I went. And so, you know, quite often a night could go from this, uh, some, you know, a collection of beetles and bugs 
to this, to this, and kind of, and then it gets kind of crazy after that. And it, and it kind of just progresses through. And, and what I find is that I, I just, I, I really take that idea of mashing two weird ideas together. And, and I have found these prompts that work really nicely for me and get me kind of to a place where I want to get visually. Um, and it kind of is like, this, this is the formula that quite often it, it's as simple as A meets B like Star Wars meets Gucci or C as D, happiness as architecture, things like that. And so what I'll call, you know, and, and which produces things like this, right? So you've got your, your Star Wars meets Gucci and happiness as architecture. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the realm that I play in almost like 90% of the time, if, unless I'm like specifically trying to generate something for a client or I'm trying to achieve something. If I'm just playing on uh, any given night, I typically kind of jump in and just start mashing things up. And I, like I said, I have my go-tos. Um, but then that what gets really interesting for me is when you, you remash the mashup. So A meets B as C or C as D meets A. Um, and then things start to get really interesting. So, for example, um, this is what you get from you know from the two double mashups that I just mentioned in the last slide. Um, so, just to show you kind of some of my favorite prompts, um, a typical evening might look like this, where uh, oh oh you know what? Can you hang on one second? You can hang on, bear with me. There's some real second. magic in the subtleties that he just gave you there around the A meets A, a meets B as C. Um, in there's you know months of experimentation that led to that conclusion, and and you'll have a lot of fun using that formula. Are you uh, are you able to see my screen again? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so. To give you an example of how it might progress um, in an evening, uh, and I, I'm really curious about how you make. I want. I don't. I'm not trying to make like a perfect. I'm never looking to create a perfect image. I'm always looking to kind of break the system or make something as weird as I possibly can. Um, so if I start with say a hyper real image of goldfish, um, I might say meets harmonious Bosch. Then I'll. Then I quite often will just take the link that is generated through the harmonious Bosch mashup. And that will meet, say, someone like Ralph Steadman, <laughs> meets architecture, meets Kurt Schwitters, a uh, collage artist, wow. meets Ayahuasca, and then meets Gucci. And so what I love is, is how you kind of can get from Goldfish to Gucci in a matter of steps and and all of the layers that kind of were in there along the way are kind of are still in there like there's different all of those different themes that were mashed up are, are still kind of in the final artwork and then of course all of those variations there's variations in everything you do so you know you end up at the end of the night having say three or four completely different end results that have all started from that kind of original idea and that original image so i find i find that just like really quite fascinating and um and it keeps yeah keeps me up at night <laughs> yeah. um so the the project that came out of all of this uh was um i wanted so like um chris said the issue i had um with what i was doing is that it, it gets kind of boring after a while and it also is just kind of like you know when i when i discovered the harmonious bosch prompt I was making these crazy awesome images and they were just blowing my mind and I was just making constant <laughs> matching everything up that I could have could with harmonious Bosch and then I went on to Instagram and realized like yeah people have figured out harmonious Bosch does weird and wild things and that's all over the place and and so I looked at my images and looked at what else is out there and I was kind of like yeah yeah I'm, I'm part of this group of people who mash harmonious Bosch up with other things but how how can I make this actually feel unique to me how can I feel like I actually own a piece of this and that it that it's meaningful to me because I would also generate all of these images that are completely fantastical 
and walk away from it the next day without feeling any investment or emotional attachment to it. It just, it was a fun night, but big deal. Um, and so around the exact same, so as I said, I'm, I'm part of the Living Forest Institute and something I discovered around the same time as I was playing around with Mid Journey was the Roberts Creek Forest Charter, um, which was written in 19, around 1994 by a guy, a local here named Adrian Belshaw. And it's really a, a manifesto in a sense. Um, we are surrounded, I don't know if, if you don't know Roberts Creek, it's a, it's a 40 minute ferry ride from Vancouver. And we're, we're very much surrounded by a tree. You know, we're, we're kind of wedged in between the forest and the ocean. And so the forests are a big deal here. We've got some beautiful like near old growth forests, just a 15 minute drive away from here. Um, and so we're, you know, this this charter, um, we are a nation of, we are the nation of Roberts Creek. We are a forest people. This is our forest charter. Mm -hmm. And it goes into, it, hopefully you can read some of that, but it goes into all of these, you know, um, how connected we are with the forest, how the trees are a part of our community, how we are, you know, we promise to uphold and protect them. Um, and so I didn't, I hadn't realized that this charter existed and I found it and I felt like it was something that was still relevant today um, as we're still experiencing clear cuts of the local natural forests. Um, I felt like it was something that, um, uh, with with the influx um, that has come of population growth around here uh, uh, since COVID, there's a lot of new people. There's a lot of people that don't necessarily fully know what the culture's like here at Roberts Creek in Roberts Creek. So I wanted them to know this charter, and I thought it was a great way to how can we connect like what's going on right now in, in Roberts Creek with something from 30 years ago. Um, and so the one thing, so while I was reading this, the, that meets Gucci prompt was something I learned, you know, was on Twitter. I think, you know, someone tweeted and was like, hey, look what happens when you put meets Gucci at the end of your prompt. And, um, and so I was playing around with that. And then I had this thought, I was like, well, how do I, what if I were to mash the last line of, of this charter um, may our actions here be so kind and wise that in time this forest cannot be told apart from the ancient whole skin of the world. Um, what if that meant Gucci? And so I plugged that in to the uh, I plugged that in to Mid Journey, and I ended up getting these uh, these images that were at once um, really compelling. And every one of them kind of had this different way of um, interpreting the, that that line mashed up with with meets Gucci, um, and so I just kind of kept generating these images and and playing around with it. And um, Slow. <laughs> and so what I've what I've done right now in the Roberts Creek Cafe. Uh, just down the road from me, I, I currently have an art exhibit right now. So I've printed out 50 of these and they're tiled on the wall in the Roberts Creek Cafe. And I have the forest charter. Um, I had printed out copies of the forest charter that you can, that you can have, that people can take for free. Um, and, uh, and so that's the exhibit that's being shown right now. And it was, and I guess like, it's kind of, you know, it's cool. People that people really have been gravitating to it. Like they walk in and you see people like just intrigued and you can imagine um, it when you see all of these kind of, you know, if you imagine them kind of tiled on the, on the wall in a similar way to as they are on the website here, you know, they're, they're all very interesting, but all together, they also create just this really interesting vibe and this, this sense of a world and an aesthetic. And, um, I feel like you hacked the system in some ways because you're using it's like you've always wanted to get these messages out there into the world about the forest alliance and stuff and now you're using this like johnny come lately trendy thing and this this you know gucci technique you discovered to kind of advance your your objectives anyway and so i, I feel like you know you kind of you kind of hacked hack the system a little bit and i really like that about it yeah i, I love that i love that there's something hyper local that's been put in there and it's almost like having, it almost feels like when I look at each of these, I can feel a little bit of a fingerprint in them. Like there's something in this that feels connected to me and connected to our local geography here. And so that was, that was the first, I mean, it, we talk about aha moments. That was the aha moment for me where I was like, oh, okay, I can actually, 
I can actually make a connection to this type of art and I can actually make it feel um, important and real um, to a cause out in the in the external world. Um, and, it, and it also marvels me, you know, one of the people who I was looking at the art was like, imagine, imagine, first of all, a small local org organization pitching this to Gucci. Um, but secondly, imagine the amount of, imagine what would go into making this campaign, um, you know, as well, like it would be, it would be insane. So like, as, as this has been showing it locally in Roberts Creek, there's been a film being produced in our, in our locale. And I just, I drive by all the trucks and the people and the, the food stands and the, you know, just the, and, and just I, I'm, I'm incredulous at the amount of work and production and people and money that it takes to create a film these days, um, you know, and to their credit, they, you know, I, much, you know, hats off to everyone involved in it, but, um, but it is remarkable kind of seeing, seeing that and then, you know, playing around in, in the AI space. Hey, hey Kevin, can I, can I just jump in here? Uh, just, just as an uh, adversarial thought, I wouldn't pitch this to Gucci. I would actually try and produce these clothes myself. <laughs> there's, there's, yeah. a brilliant, there's an amazing woman in New York uh, who has a sustainable high-end high, high end, uh, fashion line called Another Tomorrow. She's a former director of Morgan Stanley. Um, you should try and get in touch with her because... You know, one of the interesting things in terms of the passion in your life is the worlds that you love are being destroyed by the world that is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that any, you know, th there's such beauty in these clothes. And, you know, the cultural reference point is Gucci, but Gucci is not the solution, right? Okay. The solution is something extremely beautiful that serves your purpose. And, you know, I've been involved in fashion and manufacturing, and I'll tell you, you could create, you could create some magic with this stuff and actually begin to produce this yourself, should the world need more clothing. <laughs> but if you're going to pitch Gucci to get them to sell more of the crap they produce, you may as well go it alone, brother. <laughs> no, I, I, and I would never, uh, I, first of all, the Roberts, I, Roberts Creek would never allow me to uh, pitch Gucci on this. <laughs> That's, That's good. It goes. It was more, you know, the Gucci part is just that that crazy juxtaposition of things no, I that be mashed together. But uh, but yeah, the, the um, there was actually a seamstress who came to uh, the exhibit at Creek Days who was she was just looking at all the details that had been, you know, in, that went into every single one of these, and she was just marveling at how well Mid Journey did at capturing getting all of those, you know, the stitches and the the hemlines and everything. Yeah. She, it's Sorry. staggering. It's staggering, actually, because just as a kind of fashion aficionado, despite the way I dress, it takes me more to Alexander McQueen at his best than 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 Gucci. Uh, Alexander McQueen was such a dramatist and artist and the such a theatrical designer. I'm so enchanted by these images. They're so beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to talk to you more about this. I think this should be put on in Paris and New York and Milan and London at the Fashion Weeks to raise awareness <laughs> to protect the forest globally. I love it. Sorry to, Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you only interrupted me when I was saying I'd like to let people um, ask some questions now. And Bella actually has her hand up as well. So it's all good. This is what I want is uh, for you guys to be able to chat with each other. Bella. Yeah, my dog was barking. So I apologize if you mentioned this and I didn't catch it. But when you were talking about the the whole idea of the equation, I'm thinking the A meets B, S, C and that whole thing. Is that all through mid journey? I'm still learning the tools, or is it a combination of tools? That is that is mid journey, and I kind of see it almost mid journey as um, in its most basic form because I'm basically just co creating an image, copying the link to that image, dropping that link back into mid journey, and then adding another variable and kind okay. of just going go ahead, through this kind of cycle. Why don't you go ahead and bring up your mid journey? And I'd like for you to. I, I'd like for you to show us. Okay. Um, yeah. And can I just ask one more thing? Because it absolutely. keeps coming to my mind. And I'm like, I need someone to explain it to me. Um, one thing that I keep even having, like, especially the the older folks that I work with keep asking, but where is AI pulling information from? And there's this perception that it's pulling from things that are copyrighted or that you're not supposed to use so that component of ownability yes. comes comes to question can someone explain to me like because these look 
I mean, I understand the sort of filtering there we're adding so many layers to this work right and so it becomes ownable um, but I'd love to be able to speak back to that a little bit more and how whether it's ownable or what you need to do to make it ownable I think this is a great opportunity for me to give Peter a few minutes back and Peter you don't need to fire up your slides but I think uh, the spirit of what you were going to share in those slides why don't you speak to it a little bit with the question about um copyright, ownership, remixing, all that kind of stuff. Well, maybe he's gone. Totally. Yeah, happy to. So I think that there's yeah a few things to keep in mind. And I actually do have a slide, of course, uh, that I would love to pull up to illustrate this a bit because do, yeah. this is you know, a really important question to ask, right? Whose art is being used to essentially recreate and remix right those amazing beautiful images that kevin put together right and like is kevin able to actually own the copyright to those for example and sell those legally like might be different in the in the case of you know us versus canada versus europe right all of this legal context is evolving very quickly and um right now similarly to kind of Instagram, where you post your pictures there, and suddenly you actually don't really even own the rights to them, right? Famously, there was a gallery, right, who displayed an entire exhibit of someone who had taken other people's Instagram posts and put them there and were charging admission, right? And so that was legal, and people had signed on under the terms of service of Instagram to actually seed those rights. And so this is kind of a, a tricky space, right? And I will say this is not legal advice, right? I'm not a lawyer. Um, I am someone, right, who's watching this space very closely as an observer, as a journalist, talking with a lot of experts, including AI founders, as well as reporters and um, many creators and creatives as well, like you, Kevin, and um, incredible work. Yeah, really, you know, innovative use of combining some really basic sort of prompts and, and techniques in these really fascinating, marvelous explorations of, um, yeah, these different worlds colliding. And I, I love that. And that's one of the things that I think is really powerful about AI systems in general and their capabilities is basically having, you know, this brainstorming uh, tool and partner. Um, and I think one of the best ways to really conceptualize AI whether it is a text generator tool or an image or, you know, video or audio, right? It's really, I think, a creative partner. The term co-pilot comes up, right, quite a lot when you're talking with people in this field, right? A lot of the tools, even Microsoft co-pilot, right? Like, I think that's a really good way to think about it. Not an autopilot, right? We don't want to really rely or seed our own agency there, but... You know, as a creator and a creative, it's also like kind of an interesting ethical and almost like in some ways, like really personal journey and like quandary using these tools. Right. And thinking about like, how does it change my craft as a visual storyteller in particular? Right. And this is something that I've thought about a lot. I've been on podcasts sort of really d diving deep into my own philosophical thoughts on this, um, but it there's so much gray area, right, is what it comes down to about where your own sort of input lives and is really clear and evident and where, you know, these creative tools sort of intersect and take things along the journey a bit more. And they're trained on data sets, right, that are scraped, you know, the word illegal comes to mind, right? Many cases, they're, you know, litigating in court right now in the U.S., you know, famously, uh, most prominently with the New York Times versus OpenAI case, which is, you know, related to, to text predominantly, but not exclusively um, in terms of, you know, having New York Times articles ripped, um, you know, that is something that is definitely going to really shape the entire industry. And the business models moving forward here. I think that, you know, I, I laud Jeremy. I, I'm a big fan of Augie's and him personally, because he really does understand 
this context and thinks about it from all the different angles and has been very wise to incorporate, you know, ways to plug in real licensable content that, you know, has been produced by real creators who've been paid, right? Like, and anyway, it's, it's interesting that question I could talk about for probably, you know, I have an entire class on IP, right? And copyright related to all these different mediums, but in a nutshell, how does it work? What is it pulling from? I would love to share my screen now and just mm -hmm. go through a, a quick little um, explanation of how these models actually function. Can you guys see my screen here? Yes, sir. Great. Um, yeah, and then happy to you know take questions and have kind of a conversation and invite Kevin as well and and his perspective and um, you know. Right now, okay, I'll skip through these slides. I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides here and get to the good stuff, right? We can talk about public opinion stuff and all these things, but let's just think about the basics here. What is artificial intelligence? How is it working exactly in something like mid-journey? So AI has been around and been in systems that we have used every day for you know a decade or more, in many cases much longer, but... AI as a field is really having a moment right now, as we know, when it comes to generative AI specifically, which is kind of sub-discipline. And I'll walk through a little bit of how that fits in and how it it works um, in layman's terms that hopefully are pretty, you know, understandable. Cause it's it's a bit of a mystery, like even to researchers who are actually developing these algorithms and models uh, in terms of, you know, the predictability of how an input gets to an output. And that's because they're using neural networks to you know, simulate human cognitive functions like reasoning, problem solving, understanding language, right? It's a, AI is a huge, you know, really broad field. It includes everything from self-driving cars to, as we saw, Midjourney and Augie and ChatGPT, right? And it's algorithmic. Um, Okay, well, let's drill down a little bit and get closer to what we're talking about with mid-journey. So machine learning is an even narrower subset of, of AI that's specifically, you know, focused on data-driven learning and decision-making. So it involves, you know, training computers to recognize patterns and make predictions. Yeah, for example, identifying cats in photos. Uh, I know that Jeremy mentioned during his demo something called, you know, computer vision or video vision. Uh, this is a type of machine learning and natural, yeah, natural language processing technique that essentially takes all of these inputs, the data sources, whether it's you know for a generative text image generator or you know video you know, generator, like is the richness. It really feeds the algorithm. The algorithms themselves, yes, there are differentiations in them, but there's they're only as strong or as robust, right, as the data sources that they have access to and have been trained on. And so when you're using something like ChatGPT, that has been trained on, you know, scraped materials that have been found or, you know, grabbed. We use the term scrape, right, kind of to imply that it was without permission or consent or even knowledge, right? And that is the case, right, largely. Um, whether that is legal or not is currently being decided, but you know, there are companies whose entire job is to basically run these web scrapers that pull all of this text and image and other content from you know everywhere they can get their you know virtual bot hands on, and then feed them over and send them to OpenAI or others, right? Like, and so this is a massive undertaking, and it's something that is yeah really underpinning how these systems work but to get even narrower like how is it working really when you do image generation right so let's think about an even further narrower subfield here of machine learning which is neural networks right this is literally the idea of taking computer and mimicking the human brain structurally right as well as procedurally uh, as we have seen, it's incredibly powerful once these neural networks are able to develop 
you know, beyond the pattern recognition stage into this sort of next phase of not only recognizing those images, but then being able to have some sort of transfer of knowledge and creation beyond that simple pattern recognition or facial recognition, what have you, right? This is taking the next step by essentially replicating the neuronal structure of the brain, right? And all of those interconnections and synapses with a digital like analogy, right? That has been created. And so these neural networks have also been around for quite a long time. So why are we suddenly talking about them, you know, in the last 18 months or so, right? What, what happened exactly? And, you know, what is the size of OpenAI's neural network, right? Compared to human brain? Has anyone read the study or heard about if you took sort of the current neural network that a chat GPT-4 algorithm has and is composed of, uh, if it had cells for each node that were the size of a human brain, individual cells, it would be roughly the a squirrel size neural network, right? And it is it is designed to essentially mimic the human brain, which is the only type of intelligence that we are aware of and able to essentially try to replicate here when we're talking about artificial intelligence there's a lot of kind of deep questions about what it means to be human that come up because we're already seeing in these you know early early days of some of you know the chat gpt 3.5 and 4 and, and mid journey things that we thought even a few months or years ago were maybe only reserved to humans in terms of cognition and reasoning and creation, right, are now replicable. And there's, you know, a lot of ethics and a lot of legal stuff that needs to get sorted out with this. But, um, okay, what is generative AI, right? Generative AI is part of, you know, it's fueled by these neural networks, and it could be for any type of media content, right? Again, could be writing, could be images, could be music, right? There's entire products and ecosystems that are being built from the ground up, focusing on these niches, right? Like Augie for AI-assisted video editing, which is pretty interesting. But Augie itself is powered, I know, at least, I guess, about six months ago when I talked to Jeremy, you know, they were using a lot of these initial algorithmic models uh, that are open-sourced, so they're available freely to build upon with an API plugin. They're essentially a metered service in the back end to run something like Augie, right? And uh, in the case of Midjourney, right, they have their own algorithm that's that's separate. But anyway, I'm going to pause there. I'm just trying to walk through some of the basics here. And um, are there questions on this so far? I don't know how familiar people are with any of this stuff. If this is all old news, if this is, you know, something totally Peter, refreshing. Peter, none of the stuff you've gone through is the stuff that's creating fear, right? Mm -hmm. It's the next wave, right? When you marry these vast neural networks with quantum computing capability and the, you know, the, the, the fear that the AI can go rogue. I mean, what's your point of view on on that? It's not particularly germane to what we're doing today, but I'm interested in your point of view on it as an academic and scholar. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think that we need to get really serious about putting in new legislation. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon to put the brakes on this, you know, at least put in some frameworks for having a speed limit, so to speak, for the development of this sort of stuff. And I know that's already what's what's starting to happen. I'm getting into policy, but I guess in terms of, you know, the models that could run amok and create, you know, a, a Terminator uh, two level, you know, catastrophe for humans, like the, the current algorithms that are available that have been created today are not nearly at that level, right? As I mentioned, we're kind of squirrel brain analogy to human brain in terms of the size and complexity and um we're not near <laughs> sentience or consciousness or anything like that it's not even you know academics who are really serious in machine learning and you know cognitive psychology and sort of the intersection of those things there's near unanimous agreement we're not we're not there yet 
Yes, but, but it, it's how fast well, things are I, I going. Think an, I think there's an academic up at Toronto that would kind of take a little bit of a, you know, and say that there is the capability of some things to go awry. Well, um, right now. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not I mean, saying that. Yeah. I'm saying that, you know, a killer drone kind of things. And again, I know we're really off topic here. <laughs> it's yeah, inevitable. Sorry, my fault. I apologize. It happens every class and it, like it's a natural because of some yeah. of the earliest or slides I breeze through with all of kind of this sensational headlines that we're constantly being hit with. Like I'm I'm in news and journalism. That's my background. And every time I see these headlines, I shake my head and it, you know, it's starting to bother me because, you know, we need to have a basic level and understanding of media literacy when it comes to these tools. Yes, we do need regulation and policy. Yes, there are things today that could go seriously wrong. Things that I'm worried about are already, you know, the deep fake capabilities and things like election integrity, right? That is going to be a problem this year in the 1 billion plus people who are going to the polls and the global democracies, right? From the US to, to many others, right? And Already we've seen, I think, a watershed moment or two happen in the last six months when it comes to these things. The biggest one most recently is the Taylor Swift deep fake porn, right? The sexual abuse materials, non-consensual, um, where I think finally people realize that, holy crap, you can make any single person, you know, deep fake porn or do whatever you want. Like the the fabric of reality, that connection and tether between media and facts is completely spinning off into the abyss, right? That is happening right now, right? I'm not saying things are okay. That's not what I'm saying. I am terrified of this as a journalist. We do yeah. have systems though and initiatives that are promising to be able to reel this stuff in. Um, but we're going to be entering a world where we are in beyond post-truth mode, right? We're in a world where you cannot trust what you see online, period. The internet itself is also changing yeah. in ways that we haven't even begun to describe in this entire talk in a way that's going to impact our interaction with it across every device, the functioning and shape <laughs> and structure and Betty. business models of the industries that were. Yeah, it's one, of, it's one of the reasons when I was at National Geographic, uh, when they changed their terms of service, I pulled our account and said we wouldn't publish on our account because they were trying to take rights away from photographers. Yeah. And then I got a swift phone call from Kevin saying, we need to talk. And I spent an hour and a half with them on the phone telling them why the changes they were making were scaring the shit out of photographers and that they needed to walk back their language, which they eventually did. Um, and so I think you set a great foundation. I just wanted to go back to Bella's thing for a second because she talked about how do you how do you share this how do you talk about generative AI to someone who's older? And the way that I've expressed it to my mom, who's in her late seventies is, you know, I can read a hundred books and of those hundred books, I can pretty much remember word for word, a bunch of passages. I can go up to a hundred and a thousand and it becomes a little bit difficult, but I remember them all. I've probably read about, because of my academic work, all that type of stuff, I've probably read about 10,000 books over the course of my life. I know subject matter, but I probably can't, unless there's probably a handful of books I could probably quote directly. But for the most part, I understand patterns and concepts over those 10,000 books. Now, imagine a large language model that can read 75 trillion books <laughs> uh, and can see the patterns over that. And so when you put text into a generative AI product, whether it's a text form like ChatGPT, or it is a photo or image one like MidJourney, or it's video like Pika or something else, it's looking at your words, it's breaking those words down to a token. So if we say a tiger salsa dancing on a rooftop, it's sitting there breaking down your prompt into these tokens and then going back and looking for a pattern. So across that 75 trillion pieces of information, it understands what a tiger is, but it's not going to page 39 of a book that says tiger and then taking the 50 words from that page and then generating that for you. 
And so when people talk about, hey, you know, is this recreating something? Is this stealing something? No, it's synthesized and look patterns over all this vast data. Just like we as creatives, we consume things every day. We see things that come through our eyes and we see the patterns. And so I notice a brush stroke here. Or I notice the way that leather kind of will kind of uh, curl up if it's thrown on the ground. And we pick up these different things. And that's the same thing that's kind of happening in mid journey. It's taking right. those words, turning it into a token, and then finding a pattern that it has seen and then kind of pro progressing that out. The reason I love Kevin's work is because I saw things there and I know some of the intention and purpose that he put into his prompts uh, and what got out. And I can only imagine what the other images that he didn't select mm -hmm. that were made within that prompt. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that when, and I, the last thing I just wanted to say is one of the challenges with these LLMs and open AI has theirs, Claude AI has theirs, Mixtral out of France has one. There's an, there's all these kind of large language models and you'll hear a lot about bias. And the fact of the matter is, is that there is a lot of bias uh, within the different LLMs. And that's because if you only look at, if they, if you only ingest a certain piece of concept, content, you're going to kind of reflect that. So like, for instance, yeah. I did an exploration in mid journey that took song lyrics and I just took the first six words of a song lyric and I said, interpret this. And it, every time it came to love, it would show a white woman or a white couple. If I say uh, if I say artificial int intelligence, for instance, in a mid journey, it will always show a woman in some kind of cybernetics to it. Uh, one way that Chat GPT tried to figure it out when they first in introduced Dolly, if you ask for and if you you may not remember, but Dolly came out and they added four images in the beginning with Chat GPT, and so you would say basketball player. Well, what they were doing behind the scenes is they were rewriting that prompt and saying Caucasian ba basketball player, African basketball player, Latino basketball player to try and get to try and overwrite that diversity and make sure that there was a diversity of images. And so I know I'm, I, I threw a lot in there, but what I was trying to do is sit there and just kind of show that when you type something in, it's not going and stealing something lock, stock, and barrel from a designer or for a creator. What it's doing is doing, it's meant to mimic human beings and kind of synthesize the patterns that we see. And that's why we, that's why it hallucinates. The LLM, the AI wants to answer, wants to deliver on what you ask. And if it does, it can't find that pattern. That's why it'll make something up because it is so keen to deliver something to you that it will sit there and make something up. I hope some of that's helpful when you talk to folks who may not have the technical uh, foundations that some of this takes. Neil? Okay. Yeah, so um, if I'm using this, let's say for my small business, um, and I'm doing image generation for uh, a, a, a local marketing campaign. Um, how do I protect myself from Getty Images suing me for stealing it when MidJourney has a history of adding Getty watermarks because they stole the Getty database? Now, I just use that as an example because that's the one I heard of. Mm. You can guarantee that these models have gone through and um, learned from all sorts of material they were not supposed to learn from. How am I, as a, as a commercial entity, going to protect myself from the theft, previous or, uh, or otherwise, that um, these models have accomplished? Because if, if you have an artist who has made some art and has licensed it appropriately and been paid, I'm totally cool with mid-journey learning from that and then throwing me an image that's similar. However, 
or public domain, rock and roll. There's tons of art that's more than 75 years older than the artist um, since he passed away. Um, but what about the things where their, their models are uh, well known for stealing art? Um, how do I protect myself as a small business or a large business from lawsuits caused by using mid-journey or other image-based systems because I think this is less relevant with text. Okay, I'm gonna answer your question in the shortest way possible, and then I'm gonna tear it open and, do, and like let's, because yeah, it's an interesting. The way you protect yourself if you're a small business is you open the things that you make in Mid Journey inside Photoshop, and you make some change to it, and then you save the file, and now you have put the human hand into a digitally created work of art and you now can claim creator's rights over that. It doesn't speak to what you're talking about, about the stealing, theft, payment, all the rest. But if you, it does answer your question of, if I'm a small business who makes something and I wanna protect myself, how do I do it? You modify it slightly and then it becomes your own. Um, so that being said, I'm not that comfortable with the way you're talking. Um, I think Robert kind of preemptively spoke to it in some ways. It would be stealing if it went and took a Chris Krug photo and then put it in a database. And when you asked me and you said something about Chris Krug, it returned something that it was an approximation of that image. But that's not what's going on. Robert? Uh, so I, I want to make, because you and I get into this argument all the time, I want to make sure that I am clear here. <laughs> when I say that they train their models on 75 million something, they stole that shit. Uh, they went in to the internet and scraped things off. And if the, if it was, if we had the real life equivalent of them going into a bookstore and taking a copy of every book off the shelf and walking out of it, we would be going crazy and people would be locked up. You but know, because, they were trolling Flickr, right? Because it, well, because it's one in zeros. Yes, but I am happy to have my work included in the comments. I'm glad and, and, that. I'm glad that the future of intelligence was trained and, on my publicly available information. I do not Chris, consider theft. Chris, I consider that's, me that's being fantastic. Open. That's fantastic. But you know, we've been fighting this for 20 years on the internet, starting with deep linking. And if they didn't know they were doing something wrong, they would have been upfront from day one saying they had a scraper going across the internet, but they hid that. And they didn't tell anybody they were scraping the internet. And so to me, they knew they were doing something wrong. And it was only after they started getting it called out for it did they have to admit they had a scraper going out there. I hope you guys aren't conflict averse and actually find this uh, debate interesting because I'm going to lean into it a little bit more. Um, I don't think that the, that's relevant because they didn't take the books and put them in their library. They took the books and they studied how do humans write in general. They didn't take the content. They, they still have the data. No, sorry. No. It's not like they went into a bookstore and sat in the bookstore in the comfy chair and took every book and read it. it within the store, they physically took the books outside and they have that data. That's why, and, and Peter, please jump in. Like you can find these data sets online where you can get, like I can download it right now and I can go get a shit ton of data that is there. And so, it's not like they just read it from a human standpoint, right? Like I read it, I processed it, I didn't copy it. They have, they have the remnants, right? They have, they have the goods uh, within their systems. Mm -hmm. I think, that, I think if nothing else, this illustrates how gray the area is because Robert and I are so aligned on so many things, but we have not been able to get on the same page on this one for the longest time. Yeah, to to jump in, and just. Yeah, sort of piggyback on what Robert was saying too. Like, I think that this really becomes apparent the difference between sort of just training on everything here to create like human knowledge, you know, recreator and analyzer are great. But like, when you ask ChatGPT specifically, at least a few months back, hey, can you write, you know, an exact passage for an essay from XYZ author, right? Or in mid journey, when you do the same thing and ask for a style of living author, originally it would output it right directly. And you would even see sometimes the digital signatures, right? Just like if they were Getty or not. And so it's, it's beyond 
you know, the applications here when it comes to copyright in particular are most, I think, relevant and severe when it can be ripped off and replicated. And we're seeing entire websites being basically SEO hijacked. What does that mean? It means now it's possible to replicate the entire content using these web scrapers and then very simply in a matter of minutes being able to replicate that entire group of articles and content with a slightly different twist, right? You can put a different, you know, brand voice or tone on top of it. You can also plug in those buzzy SEO keywords of, you know, the latest trends looking to make sure that it rises to the top in yeah. search results. And there's been basically SEO takeovers of websites where they're essentially a knockoff that spun up overnight. And suddenly, you know, this is, this is a killer for a publisher, right? Like this is something that, or brand of any type, right? Could be any business, but um, this, this is what's happening, right? This is what's possible right now. And this is why we're talking about it. Um, does, does anyone who hasn't weighed in, hasn't weighed in so far, have anything they want to contribute? If not, I'm going to pull us in a different direction. Any closing thoughts on this by anyone? I think that the main thing that we all care about is liability. It's like the only thing that we care about and what can be proven in the court of law. There's no, there's not enough legislation. So what's going to happen is when someone can identifiably point something to you, there's going to be a lawsuit and no brand is going to want to take on that liability. When we use our generative AI products, they come with a guarantee because they come, they're a product that is, is powered by Microsoft and it comes with a, it comes with indemnity for what they, what they give you. And that's how that product and that, that is, the information they give you is siloed such that it can be protected by the indemnity clause. And no brand in their right mind is going to take on anything other than that. And look, yeah. look, it's going to be the wild, wild west because, you know, uh, legal rules and social ma uh, mores just don't advance as quickly as technology. Right. And that was problematic when it was just 18 month tech cycles. With AI, you're getting new models with every day. And so it's just advancing so quickly. And so that becomes part of the problem is that we don't know, like, Peter, I love the fact that you started to talk about policy, but part of the challenge is like, we don't have a political system or a legal system that can move fast enough to adapt the law. And we saw that, like, let's just think about when cameras were at, to the phone and, you know, you had the camera phone and the next thing you know, people started taking it places. And then folks were like, oh shit, yeah, maybe a camera phone shouldn't go into the locker room, right? Like it was a great idea in the beginning and we adopted it so quickly, but like, oh, remember how quickly uh, gyms had to start changing their their rules about like where you could take your phone. It's just, it's, it's challenging because technology moves. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, just because we can build it, should we build it? And there are a lot of people, and this has become from an ethics standpoint, are just kind of pushing the boundaries at a rate that it's hard. To, I I have sat here. I think I said I created my first page and web page in 1993. I can't keep up, and I'm normally bleeding edge. And I find that I can't keep up with stuff. But I see Frank joined us. I'm going to turn it over to Chris so uh, Frank can jump in. Thanks, Robert. And I'm actually going to keep Frank on ice for five minutes, but welcome, Frank. Frank's going to dip in here in five minutes. He's going to give us a little future photography kind of demo. He's the artist in residence at the Future Proof Creatives channel right now. But before we do that, Kevin, would you pop back over to your mid journey and give us a little demo of what you were talking about there? Um, <clears throat> sure. Like in real time? If you want to, you don't have to, but I, you, you were, when we switched gears, you had your mid journey open, you were starting to scroll back and a lot of us haven't seen that before. And so I think that'd be a great place to, and then yeah, I, mean, I can show you, you and I have a different uh, approach. So I'm hoping at the end, I'm going to jump into my mid journey and then show people a different way of doing it as well. Right. Um, I mean, I can show you, like, if you go back to kind of what I showed you today. So I'm going to uh, narrate a little bit too, guys. So we're in discord right now. 
Midjourney is an image generation tool. It only lives inside Discord and you prompt it by literally like chatting to it like you would chat to a person on Discord. And so that's what we're looking at here. And right. when you see those uh, groups of four images, those are the results being returned from a prompt. So he says goldfish and he gets these four images back. And underneath those, you see U1, U2, V1, V2. U1 is like, if you like the first image, you can upscale it by pressing U1. And if you like the first image, but you want to see some variations of it, you can run four more variations by pressing V1. All right, over to you, Kevin. Okay. So yeah, so so it does, there is a bit of a curation process to this in the sense that, you know, this all started off with me typing goldfish hyperrealism into the prompt um, and getting these four images, which I chose, of which I chose this one. And, um, you know, and obviously the journey would have gone a whole different direction if I had chosen any of the other three. Um, just speaking to like what Chris was talking about, you know, when you do upscale an image, you get additional <clears throat> uh, options to upscale it even further. Um, you can also zoom out and see what is around the image. Um, and you can also do a very, you can do variations either subtly or strongly. I want to pause there uh, for a quick second as well. So. Um, guys, let's wear our designer hats for a second. And so like in the old <laughs> days, I was a photographer and I was feeding my photos to designers. And many times a designer would be like, yeah, this is great, but there's no room for the title or the copy. Could you uh, give me a wider edit on the same thing? And it's like, no, man, that's what I got. In that, here in Midjourney now, we can create the rest of the fish tank that this thing lives in. Um, we can zoom out and zoom out and zoom out till it's a whole school of fish or whatever. So it's a real, whole new world when it comes to designs and layouts, whole new things are possible that weren't possible before. And I was to say one more thing. One of the coolest collaborative projects I've seen related to zoom out was people took famous album covers. And the one that I liked the most was the, the movie poster for Pulp Fiction of the, of uh, what's her name, Uma laying on the bed smoking or whatever. And then they zoomed out, zoomed out and like showed the rest of her dirty room and then the house that she was actually living in and all this stuff that doesn't actually exist. The, the AI imagined it into existence or whatever. So that, that's the zoom out function. Right. And I've actually used, that's been one of the most like practical, like I've, I've, I'm working on a designing an annual uh, sustainability report right now for a client. <laughs> and in terms of just not being able to, not having enough photo to crop it the way I wanted it in a space and just being able to add background junk, like basically, you know, like fill in the rest of this truck and add some background to a, a space so that I can then shrink the image down more. Um, that's been an invaluable, you know, that would be something I would have done in Photoshop. It would take me like two hours or three hours to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that, so yeah, so in Discord, so I came up with this image um, when I was originally putting the presentation together, I, I started by just taking that image and mashing it up with each of the different prompts that I wanted to have in it. But then I realized that wasn't actually demonstrating what so I wanted. To there's do. a unique thing going on here that he's showing. So his prompt is URL of the previous image yeah, makes so. a new modifier. So he copies the URL and drops it into the prompt directly. Which so I can copy the link to that. Be cool, not something I usually do. To that image. Um, and then I, yeah, so then I just, I guess, where did I start here? So I, I, at first, I, yeah, so like I said, at first I was just using that original image and putting the the prompt on it. But then I realized that didn't actually show my how my process works. So I started again and started by getting... Yeah, so that this is where that first harmonious Bosch photo came from, image came from. And then I just started copying that image, adding it to the next prompt and adding the next variable to the mix, which produced these four. And then I just kind of upscaled the one I wanted and kept moving through. So so it is curious uh, to, to your point uh, or to someone's point, like going back from um, when I was planning this art show, you know, going back and looking at all the meet Scucci images that didn't make it into my final 50 and also seeing like some of the directions that would have probably sent me on a whole other you know into a whole mm -hmm. other space if I had chosen that one versus this one you know mm -hmm. uh, so it does get uh yeah so, so you're leaving a lot of ideas behind sometimes uh -huh. um 
and choosing to kind of, so I do like that as well in the terms of as a creative and as someone with, you know, that you are, you are making a choice to, I was hoping it would be more like this, or this is, this is kind of the direction I want to keep exploring in. You're definitely more methodical than I am. I'm definitely like throw a whole bunch of stuff up and then sift and sort and scratch <laughs> part later. And, um, well, this was pretty linear because I, this was linear because I was 15 minutes away from jumping into this workshop, but you know what also, yeah, I'm realizing that what you've done here is you've recreated your process from nine months ago. Yes. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else uh, you'd like to show us here? Or can I give a hard break over to Frank? What are you asking me? Is there, yeah, is there something, is there anything else you'd like to show us here before I kind of switch gears? Uh, no, no, I think I'm good. Awesome. I really appreciate it, Kevin. Okay, guys, I feel time breathing down my neck a little bit, and that's why I'm kind of picking things up a little. Um, so just bear with me. There's just tons of stuff to share. And I've actually decided while we've been on this call that I'm going to give you guys an extra hour, not today. Uh, what I want to do is I, uh, you'll see on that uh, agenda I had, I had a whole list of tools we were going to walk through and we're just going to have to push pause on that because we've been talking this whole time. And, and so what I'm going to suggest is that we meet another evening for an hour, it's optional and I'll walk you through tools and that'll just be a bonus extra credit time as well. Um, Frank, you is up next. Frank is another one of my original and longtime collaborators. We probably learned as much about this stuff from each other as anyone else around. He's a part of the original um, server, and he's really been pushing the boundaries of photography, new school photography inside um, the image generation. He uses them all, which is cool because he has a wide purview across the different tools, and he is constantly trying to break them. And he's come up with some processes for understanding their subconscious and their psyche. For instance, if you just tell it to make a funny image without telling it what you think is funny, it's going to return what it thinks is funny. And if you keep prompting it for a funny image over time, you can watch as its sense of humor develops and it, or changes. It might uh, six months from now start returning a different group of images as funny images or something like that. So hopefully that steals no thunder. Over to you, Frank. You can go ahead and turn on your mic for us. Unmute, please. Yo, Frank, can you unmute? Weird. I see it. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. Great. Can you see me okay? Yeah, well, you're all good. Now we can hear you too. All right, thank you. Uh, I was actually meeting in the Google Meet but I realized that this thing's a Zoom call. So sorry about that, uh, but hi everyone. So thank you, Chris, for the introduction. So I am traditionally a photographer, uh, fine arts and editorial. Uh, actually it was Chris who got me into photography like more than 15 years ago. Uh, but I've also been working very recently on AI. So I am a photographer um, as a hobbyist, but I found out that I also like AI as well. So with generative AI images, originally it's the way you, you speak with these, with these systems, whether it's Midjourney, Dali, or the Wonder app, or even Stable Diffusion, is with, with the prompt engineering. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you have used visualizers already, but what's happening is that the visualizers keep evolving. So the prompts that you use maybe like in Midjourney, like in version four, will just totally gunk it up in version six, uh, because they keep changing the parameters and the defaults. So let me see if I can share uh, my screen. Frank's the only guy in the world I know who's so committed to a mobile future that he has <laughs> given up his laptop completely so that he experiences the internet like there. most of the world does. Yeah, yeah, because you know, I'm Gen Z, so I'm totally um, mobile apps. So uh, can you guys see my screen? Sir. Okay, so right now I'm in Midjourney version six alpha. And I think within like a, by the time of Christmas, I think they're gonna release the you know version six officially, and then it'll be a website. So you won't have to use Discord in the future. But right now, as I was telling Chris that I've become more minimal in my prompts. And the reason why is one, um, 
in the past, in like version four and the early versions of the mid journey, like a year ago, you had to be very specific and you had these very long prompts describing camera angles, focal length, apertures, things like that, as well as the type of lighting. You had to go into a lot of detail and that worked. And we were trying to approach photorealism. But now in version six, it, photorealism is default. If you just put like, a, you know, and here, here's a hack. If you want photorealistic images, the only thing you have to add is mm, like a decade, 1990s film. Okay. And then a prom. And I, like I, as Chris mentioned, I like a creepy picture. Now, the reason I like this is there's a little bit of randomness, um, but it's also like as Chris says, I'm trying to track exactly what the visualizer thinks is kind of creepy. So it changes and it changes um, even within the same day or sometimes you'll get recurring images. It used to be like maybe a few weeks ago, what it thought was creepy is some little girl standing in a field. And then other images are, you know, maybe like a, a horrific demonic looking face. But you'll also find that that the same prompt, a creepy picture in Dali or in Wonder has different results. And that's because the visualizers, um, they have a lot of changes underneath. And to us, even as a person who uses Midjourney and Dolly every day, I, it, it's a little bit of a slot machine. I don't know what I'm gonna get because it's probabilistic. But even if, if I think I know what I want, it'll still sort of go a little bit wonky sometimes. And Chris and I were talking that in the past that we found out that you can get much better images if you put in the aspect ratio of the data that's trained. So if you want like a cinematic photorealistic image, if you put um, basically the aspect ratio of uh, six, 16 by nine, you'll get really good images. But if I use the same it's prompt- trained and, on movie stills and you're looking it's for in movie stills type up. things. So just by specifically asking for the ratio, the, the, the size of the thing that you want, you'll limit the training data set. Right. And so when, it, when you, you ask it something unusual, the visualizer will try to synthesize a new image, which it has never seen before. And back in the day, it would just turn into like this really kind of hallucinogenic, groovy picture, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. But uh, now it, it defaults to basically photorealism and it looks almost like fashion and editorial photography, but it's a little bit kind of boring, I think. So I find other hacks to try and uh, do that. looks like my fast imaging is pretty slow. I've but, never seen it be uh, this slow, Frank. How do you even deal? What? How do you even <laughs> oh, deal? Okay. Use a like, multitask. Like, so if I'm not on this, let me show you something on the Wonder app. So I, I don't know if you guys know this. This is my little secret, which I'm going to reveal, is that I learned visualizers before Midjourney, before Dolly, on something called the Wonder app on iOS. It's an app, and you pay, like, $30 for a whole year of unlimited images, but it's pretty good. But it's, I like it because it's pretty weird. So while we're waiting for Discord, I'm gonna use this parameter and I'm gonna use the same thing. A, I'm not gonna put a decade, I'm just gonna put a creepy photo. And it's a little faster. I'm pretty sure they're using some sort of stable diffusion, but they've been fine tuning it so the images become much better. But with the Wonder app, it actually has a lot of uh, default settings and it's also pretty easy to jailbreak. So this is, this is the type of images you get from the Wonder app. And this is what it considers creepy. It looks like it's architectural photography, uh, at least in a square format. Now let's see if Discord has That's come back to its senses. A lot different than what- Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is what Discord came up with. As you see, it's, uh, it's a little bit more varied. Uh, a bunch of dolls, a woman looking at an image of an eye, and a okay. oh, and a creepy kind of underage supermodel in a deserted room. So that's sort of a that's usually the, the type of images you'll get uh, with a creepy photo, even though they're varied. That's basically what it kind of cycles through most of the time. It used to be you get the most horrific images in the past, but. I think they've censored it to some degree. Um, I don't know, Chris, have you talked about the weird parameter? No, nope. I haven't really showed much at all in Midjourney, and you're welcome to do so as well. Okay. So 
for someone like me, and I'm maybe, not a commercial. Maybe introduce that it has a bunch of parameters first, and then bring in the weird. Parameters. Okay. Okay. So Mid Journey has these parameters: everything from style to uh, like style, and also speed. Speed just makes 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 you sort of choose how dense the picture is based on the the number of things that are seated. But let me just do the, my little creepy photo, creepy again. <laughs> Imagine. Hey Frank, can you talk. I drive. Okay. Yeah. So what does that mean? <laughs> you're you're gonna do it? Yeah, I'll do whatever you say. You guys can see my screen now, right? Okay. Yep, I can see you. Not my screen. Okay, one sec. Can other people in the class who aren't on their phones see my screen? No, I just see um, you Frank are sharing. Frank screen. needs to get. Yeah. I see Frank's. Okay. Oh, should I should I stop my? No, you keep going. Sorry, guys. You keep going, Frank. Okay. So, can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay. So, the weird parameter is my favorite one because if you want the, the thing about the thing about uh, Mid Journey is that the images look beautiful, but they've been styled to look beautiful. But if you want something more varied or a little, you have to use like other parameters, like you know, and weird's the best one. It goes from zero to three thousand. So let me just put. Um, yeah, I'm sorry because like uh, yeah, I'm I'm typing on a on a mobile device, so. My way of explaining to people what weird does is Robert said to you earlier that the mm -hmm. LLM is trying its best to return to you exactly what you've asked for. Well, when you introduce the weird parameter, essentially uh, it generates the first image in accordance with what it thinks you're asking for. Then it takes the weird value and tries to take you as far away from the previous image. It, it like tries to answer your question a second time but taking it as far away from the first image as possible. And so it, it tries to create really hardcore variants from the beginning that don't match. It, it also, it, it doesn't also default to good quality images. So sometimes you get something like, it looks like a really bad photo photograph. It becomes more lo-fi and more analog. But I find it interesting because, uh, you know, I, I'm as a photographer, I love things like the Holga <laughs> and all the, the low file stuff and the pinhole cameras. So here, if, here's a, an example of what you're going to see with the weird 3000. So this is set to maximum. And you don't get those kind of images. If you notice, it's a little bit blurry. It's a lot of focus. And the early days of the visualizers where you get like really wonky stuff, you're going to get that with weird and you know, some of them are actually beautiful. Like this image is pretty beautiful. Uh, but this one looks more like a graphic and less like, well, what you'd expect. Oh, did I get cut off? You got, can you guys still see me? Yeah, you're back now. Okay. Yeah, the visualizers, but yeah. So with, so that was weird. And the one thing I like about the Wonder App, and I'm back to the Wonder App, is that it, it seems to default on weird anyway. So a creepy photo. So I'll try that again and see what comes up. So for me, um, the visualizers, even though I do make images when I do presentations. Um, oh, so my actual field is that I'm in LLM, AI, LLM chat. So I actually work on agents, but yeah, it's still pretty beautiful. I think it's the quality is actually pretty good. So if I did this like a year ago, it would look totally terrible, but they've been fine tuning it. So these models will continue to evolve. So when I tell people about learning about visualizers is that memorizing the prompts doesn't really work because they're going to keep tinkering it with in the back. So by version 6.5 or 7, even the same prompts that I use, they have totally different results. But um, the only way to sort of learn it, either by reading a Medium article or a YouTube video of like what these hacks are, is to just play with it yourself. And, you know, so I'm, so have, have you talked about um, Dali, Chris, or? No, I'd like for you to do that now. And then we're okay. going to bounce over. After you do Dolly, we're going to bounce over um, to Robert Michael Murray to show us some Daniel Brandt billiards visualization stuff. Okay. So Dolly 3 is the visualizer that's in both ChatGPT and also Bing Image Creator. So I just did this like uh, before I came to this call. 
And it, I, the only prompt I have is cat eating worm. So, <laughs> but you know, the, the quality of this image is like really good. I mean, this it didn't do this like even three weeks ago. I mean, this is photorealistic. Uh, I mean, the worm looks a little weird, but I mean, that cat looks fantastic, you know? <laughs> and so if, if you don't know, Bing Image Creator is free. You can actually like go to Bing Image Creator, create an account, and they'll give you like 15 credits, which regenerates like, um, you know, maybe every three or four days and you get another 15 credits. But if the one way to get around that is like, you just open up different accounts on different browsers. Like this one's on Chrome. You open up another one with another email on Safari and then you get 30 credits. But yeah, so I just discovered this today is that this thing is like, has changed from the old Bing. And even though ChatGPT, and let me go to ChatGPT to show you why it's different. Mm, somewhere here is ChatGPT. <laughs> okay. So in ChatGPT, there's actually a thing called Dali. And I'm trying to find where that is. I see your panda. Oh, here it is. Yeah. yeah, this is the panda. So now this exact same thing, this is exactly the same model, but somehow the open AI version of this uh, is different. Oh, cat eat worm, cat eating a worm. And the beauty about it is that each time you do this in Dolly 3 via chat GPT-4, it'll always give you two images. And I don't know how to do this. I've tried to duplicate this in a custom GPT, and I don't know how to get two images with like one prompt. And on the Microsoft, being image creator, you get four images and that's free. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but Dolly 3 has gotten a lot better just in like two or three months. So uh, yeah, I'll give you a little a lot in the last version, especially in its ability to handle some text and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah but see, it defaults to this is cat eating the worm in Dolly 3. It, it looks very cartoony. But it's very cute. I mean, in terms of visuals, like graphics and illustrations and paintings and styles of that, um, Dolly 3 is much better than Mid Journey. Mid Journey, you can do it, but you got to kind of work it. Um, and I think that the best feature about Dolly 3 is the fact that you can easily put text into your images, more or less it works. So for this one, I have the little cat eating the worm. Um, I'll just say, add a sign saying hello. I mean, this is how easy it is to put text into Dolly 3, which is actually pretty good. So if you're making a greeted card or a happy birthday, I just make one of these things and send it off to my friends. But, you know, it's a little bit cutesy. It's, uh, but, you know, if you have like little kids or little nieces and nephews, it works wonders as well. Now you could do the same thing with Mid Journey, but um, Mid Journey's text feature is not that great. So if you look at this, um, it spells it's actually pretty good. Writes them in the wrong language. Yeah, it's struggling with uh, topography and text so far. Which one? This this one? Mid Journey. Oh yeah, mid, yeah. Mid Journey is like I don't know. It's it's just it can do it, but it's it's much more pronounced. So if you want to put text into Mid Journey, you have to say this text quotation mark the text close quotation marks and where it's going to appear like on a shirt or on a hat. But the thing right. is, Dolly three. Hmm? I just I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, yeah, Dolly 3, since it's, it's from OpenAI, it understands languages better. So the prompts, you could describe it in natural language and you'll, you'll get it. But if you want photorealism, um, Dolly 3 is not as good as my journey. And uh, mm. thank, you, thank you very much for coming and showing us a couple different visualizers and talking about some of the differences between them. You know, you're, you've always really got me experimenting and breaking out of my, my normal tools and exposing me to new ones. And I'm always grateful for that. So thanks, Frank. You're welcome. Next time I'll tell you how to do deep fakes and how to shell break it to make pictures which it's not supposed to make. But thank you. Uh, dang, Nabbit, I want to get to that, but I'm feeling pressed for time. Um, sure, sure. Another time. Actually, guys, Frank is leading an artist talk on my Discord tomorrow at 3 p.m. And he can talk to you all about how to make deep fakes and that kind of stuff tomorrow at 3 p.m. on my Discord. I can send out a link to that after. Um, okay. Robert now has a client called Brent Billiards, who he is helping do some visualizations using mid journey and his process is awesome. And so are the results. So Robert, would you take about 10 minutes or five minutes and show us what you got? Yeah, no problem. So I have a client 
who is a 70 year old. Here's Dan. Uh, yeah. Who's 70 year old uh, game table maker. Uh, he is an ex environmental lawyer, but for the past 50 years has been making game tables. Uh, and his father before him made game tables and was part of uh, uh, Brunswick Billiards. And so he has a long history. Uh, but he's also someone who embraces new technology. So he's been using 3D printing, different things like that. And his view of game tables is they look like fr furniture and he wants to make functional pieces of art. And so one of the things that we did last year, this was... Um, in March is we decided to take this design exploration in which we use this car as the basis of how could we design, how could we come up with new game tables, different things. And so in um, mid journey, I used this idea of this, the, the leather, the colors, and I started making images. So this is an AI image of a New York penthouse um, and then started going into different tables. And, uh, you know, here I'm, at, you know, I asked for perforation, uh, some leather, different colors. And so uh, looking for something a little bit more ultra modern, this doesn't look like a traditional kind of coffee table that's been turned into a game table. Uh, and, you know, small little chess table, different exploration, kind of, again, using that car as the inspiration of this. Uh, we He's interested in moving beyond and actually building out entire game table, game game rooms. And so we started to explore other types of furniture, ottomans, benches, bar carts, uh, really playing with colors, uh, styles. And then we started getting into some kind of lighting and what would be the lighting that we would associate it with it. Um, even going down to the dog beds, like Cute. what could be done. I want and one like, of those for baby Jesus. <laughs> and so like everything that we chose here and put into this, and then it was like, hey, I really am going to go Uber for my clients and actually start to build some other kind of accessories into it. Um, and so that was, you know, one kind of exploration um into uh how we were using it and i don't know if i'm going to be able to do this uh so i want to i have didn't allow me to share my entire screen and so i wanted to go back and show just two things um first is um uh do you see this uh yep instagram thing that I did. So this was me playing with the image started originally around here and I just started playing ups and started creating that. And to just kind of show that is, so here's my- um, Robert, yeah. say, say that again. I'm not sure that everyone caught it. I barely did. I know, I'm gonna show it here. So yeah. here is a product photography for an ultra modern pool table. I want it to have glaze. Again, I want, I don't want it to look like a table. Um, I want it to look like a functional piece of art. And so I really wanted this kind of glossy look. And I and for some reason, when I did this prompt, it decided just to show me parts of the table. And I was like, oh, I really like this one. And so I upscaled that. And then I decided, well, I want to see more. I want to go to the right. So I said, hey, pan right and show that. And so then it created that. And then I'm like, oh, I really like this one. And so I have more at a table and I'm like, well, I don't want to pan right again. What I want to do is I want to zoom out. And then it gave me different versions of zoom out. And when you start to look at these, it's really, you start to see small uh, kind of changes like a plant here and a plant there, a purple chair there. Um, and so that got me to going to um, this and me deciding, oh, I really like that. Um, and so, you know, what started as a corner of a table, I now have a full table that I can also show him and I've shown him this and he's like, yep, I can build that. I know exactly how to get these curves. We'd work with an artist to get the right kind of painting um, and we can get that look. 
Um, and and you've got a cool purple chair that matches and an art installation and a whole interior design. That's pretty incredible from the corner of a table. Yeah, and so then the one last kind of show you um, is, and this goes a little bit into that um, thing, sorry. Uh, you know, when you have, Chris knows I have like crazy amount of tabs and windows and different things. And so I need to get to the right thing. So here's some tables I've been working on uh, with him recently. The stuff you saw from a year ago, this is me kind of pushing the boundaries, uh, style-wise, color-wise, material-wise, uh, just kind of settings. Um, again, going for that, I we want functional pieces of art, things that someone comes in and they just kind of stare at, and but also you can sit there and, and play pool if you wanted to. And so this is kind of just selections, different styles um, from an interior design standpoint and those things. And one last thing, because I want to connect the two. So I create those images, right? But now I need to handle something kind of functional. And what I need to do is I, I want to... I want to put them online, but I don't want to necessarily have to figure out certain things. Uh, I, you? you know, so I have this table. And so I created this GPT in OpenAI. And what it does is it's a photo editor for me. So I'm now going to upload this photo. And it's going to think, take a look at it. And what I've asked it to do is give it a name, write an alt description that I can use when I'm posting online so it can be accessible, write a detailed description of the table, and then finally create a social media post that I could use to add to kind of LinkedIn. And when I was talking earlier about this idea of going zero to one, this is kind of what I mean. I'm not going to necessarily use this verbatim because I don't think it necessarily captures everything, but it helps me get very quick to the point of here's a good accessible, you know, alt description that can be used uh, for screen readers. And here it starts to go in and become a little bit more kind of prosy, like a, you know, high end, you know, kind of um, magazine kind of thing description, and then I can go and edit it. And so just kind of showing you uh, two things, this idea of being kind of creative and creating these pieces and kind of reimagining of how that could apply. And I know Samantha mentioned construction and rooms and I think he saw some of that that I kind of built into the styling of something. So not only you saw a table, but you saw an overall design experience that the table fits in. Because I think that's one of the difficult things for clients with, in working with Dan. He's like, Robert, I can build anything. Just tell me what you... And I think we know that when people are said, hey, I can build anything, you get this paralysis. They don't know what to say. Yeah. Like just, you know, and so they don't know how to express their imagination. And now I've created all these images that I can show and I can spark their imagination and being like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like that, but I don't like that. And so that really allows him as a designer to sit there as a builder and a craftsman to sit there and have that conversation with somebody and help them go from zero to one. Um, and then it help, and then they work with through the whole process and then kind of functionally. Um, I, I forget, uh, I think it was uh, Miriam, if I, from a business standpoint, I now have these images and as a, a marketer, I need to get this up online and I've taken an image, I've trained the GPT to help me get some words on a paper because it's always easier to edit mm -hmm. than it is to get those first 10 words. Mm -hmm. And so now I can kind of adapt that. 
is that 10 minutes? I don't want, I want I to make know. sure. It's just amazing though. Really? Okay. I mean, I, I've watched you all the time and I still, I haven't seen some of that stuff. Anyone got Happy to answer questions if anyone had questions. It's amazing. First of all, Robert. Yeah, this is really breathtaking. Yeah. Really in, enjoying seeing some of these different explorations here too. Uh, I mean, yeah, different medium, so to speak, right. Then uh, some of the work that Kevin showed us earlier, but just as, you know, impressive in terms of some of the real tangible, you know, creative outcomes that are really just not possible without these tools in the same well, way. I, at least, I, right? The last thing that I want to kind of leave with is, you know, I've done, you know, I've sat in this world of storytelling for the past 30 years of my career and I'm dangerous enough with tools. Um, I can edit video and final cut. I can do all these things. I could code, I can do that, but it's not necessarily my day-to-day -day passion. And there have been people who are great at all these individual tools. But what I really love about this generative stuff is I can get an idea out of my brain and immediately start iterating. And so for me, the reason I really am fascinated about generative AI is for people who can describe, you know how it's like, hey, if I could just tell you what's in my head, well, now you can, right? Like just start talking, just start describing. And you you no longer have a barrier or this friction of, well, I don't know Photoshop or I don't know how to cut video. Um, start expressing. So there's a part of me that says, hey, this is starting to democratize you know, kind of storytelling and being creative in very exciting ways. And I hope we hear a lot of people who felt like they've been locked out of being able to share their stories to now find new tools to be able to express themselves. Thanks, man. Are you guys seeing my screen now? Yes. Awesome. I wanted to show you guys a couple more things here in these last few minutes as well. So I'm in mid journey. The way you uh, often uh, start things in mid journey is with the slash command and then the word imagine. Um, so I've just sent it off to create an image of a solar punk. The other command that I use all the time is called describe. And that was the one I wanted to show you guys here real quick. Describe uses mid journeys eyeballs to tell you what it sees. And I have, this is my new favorite tool. It's where I start almost everything these days. So I want to describe an image that I just saved of just an interior for um, Sam was asking about interiors. Let's see what it says. Oh, shoot. One sec. The image that I grabbed, it didn't like. Because it was a WEBP. Yeah, there's these, there's two new formats. The other one's called like AVEC or something, and it doesn't like those ones either. There we go. Okay, so I'm asking it to describe this image. And these were its, uh, returns of my word uh, solar punk that came up while we were waiting there. And I want to mess with this one. So I'm going to click upscale. And just so you guys can see, I'm also going to click vary so we can get four variations from it. Um, when you click vary, you can change your comp slightly. And uh, I'm just going to make sure it knows we want interior designs. So now it's going to vary that image, but with a little bit more information. But what I wanted to show you guys was this. This is four prompts that have been written by Mid Journey based on that photo that I fed to it. it this is what it thinks it sees. And just take a quick uh, read through those prompts. So you can start to understand it's like four different perspectives on the same image. It's four ways that you might write prompts to get an image like the one that we see here. And then it's got this really cool button, which is my favorite button in all of Mid Journey right now. It's called Imagine All. And it essentially runs all four of these prompts for you. 
So just based on this one image, I'm about to get 16 variations. And it's gonna run those in the background and we'll switch gears in our multitasking brains. This was our solar punk image that we upscaled. I'm gonna upscale it creative just to show you what that does. And these were the four variations that it ran when I said, yeah, we kind of like that, but we want to explore some more ideas. So it's the same structure more or less, but in different environments with different details. And you know, if you were doing Kevin's approach, you would just right click and say, I'm sorry, copy link. So the link's in my clipboard. And now you type slash imagine, he drops the link in and then he says meets Gucci. And we'll see what happens. I think it's gonna Gucci-fy that home for us. Now, we're gonna go back again, switching back in our multitasking brains. We've described this image. Those are the four text prompts. We hit imagine all. And so now we're gonna to start to get our results down here. So this was the first crack at it based on those. The first set of prompts, second set of prompts, third set. And this one down here is the fourth set. And I wanted to show you guys one more thing. I know this is really fast and furious, but we only have five minutes. So it's like mid journey has two ways of looking at it. You can only interact with it through the discord. You can only make new images with it through the discord. However, it's got a really useful profile page. So what I feel like I just did was generate a whole bunch of concepts based on that one image that I liked. And now I want to go back and I want to start to review those concepts and make some sense of them. And I do that here on, the, on their website. You can see all those ones are, are bound there together. And then it shows you here what the prompt was that was used to get those images. This is where you can download the high res. Hey, it looks like our Gucci came back. Let's go take a look. So, you know, we made our room, then we made the variations of the room, and then we added Kevin's prompt to it. And that's where we ended up. Solar Punk meets Gucci. So I'll leave 30 seconds here at the end for questions. How are you guys doing? Is there anybody left? I'm here and I'm just fascinated beyond belief. Like what a, a such a door has been opened for me. Miriam, I wanna give you a personal tour of the art that you and Barry have been commenting on sometime. Maybe we could just take 15 minutes sometime and I'd love to just walk you through how I got there and how we make new stuff and just show you and and see your yeah. expressions and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, would love it. It's it's really cool stuff. The screen sharing really helps me see how you work with the interfaces because it's all a mystery to me. I haven't really used much, um, so to actually see it being used live is really helpful. Uh, it's far easier than I imagined it. Yeah, yeah. Um, when my, I will schedule that one hour for sometime soon, like in the next week, and that will be will be in tools the whole time on that one. It'll be a, it'll be like five minutes in this tool and then five minutes in this tool. And I'll just take you guys on a, a buffet through my personal, you know, quiver of AIs that I'm using on the daily. And Neil, I think that's an important point. Uh, Cause I think that's the, that rapid iteration, right? Being able to look at something and be like, oh, I like that, but what if we did this? And just imagine what it normally would take through a creative process. I think, that is exhilarating, but I also can understand why that is terrifying, mm -hmm. you know, from a career standpoint of being like, oh, well, normally it would be this kind of process. And so how do we look at these tools of be, as being a force multiplier 
that doesn't erase the human and actually allows them to have a bigger tool set to be to bring their talents to it. Um, because what you put in, the better you put the stuff in, the better your output. For sure. Yeah, that other fellow's Augie tool blows me away. That would be a great one for you, actually, Neil, because you can you there's so much you can do, and it's really, really easy. I mean, gosh, and you being a voiceover actor too, you should be recording your own voice, and then you could make Augies in your voice all the time. You know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff for you to do there. I'm even thinking like your um foodie video, your foodie stuff you always do. I mean, you have some pretty impressive uh reels. <laughs> And your yeah. moments of Zen, Neil, Neil posts these daily moments of Zen to help people uh, declutter and depoliticize their Facebook feeds. And the moment I, I post a daily moment of calm. It's yeah. 30 seconds long and it's, yeah. It helps me remain calm. <laughs> so follow me on Twitter, Real Neil Deal. Oh. Yeah, and he's on Discord. Here, let me grab an invite before you guys leave for everybody. I'll send it somewhere else as well, but let me just make sure you're all invited. I know Sam Oaks is on there. I've been seeing her pop up lately. Mm, if anyone feels like Discord is not for them, don't worry about it. There's other ways to stay connected as well. But um, I am going to drop this here on the channel, and I'll send around a follow-up as well. Yeah, um, we're putting together a LinkedIn group so you can also connect professionally and share ideas through that. And we'll send that out. Yeah, we'll be launching that here in the next little while. Robert's kind of spearheading that initiative. There will be an evaluation form come out uh, automated through the system after this. Uh, please put your honest feedback there. We're um, building this thing from the ground up and we plan to do a lot more of this kind of stuff. So we'd love to hear what we're good at and we'd love to hear the room for improvement as well. With that, I bid you adieu. Thank you. Good guys. Bye.